Good evening and welcome to the July 12th, 2023 meeting of the Murfreesboro Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Matthew Blomley. I'm the Assistant Planning Director and serving as uh, Chair Pro Tem. As our rules and procedures call for, we are required to conduct our uh, elections for officers at the, at the first meeting of July every year. So um, uh, we're calling the meeting to order and uh, we have determined that we have a quorum. All seven members are present. Um, with a motion from the Planning Commission, if um, would uh, if the commission would uh, would you or me to uh, to modify the order of the agenda and put item 5A ahead of item 4, if we could have a motion for that. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any I, opposed? I think you should have to do the rest of it, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I was not prepared for that. <laughs> She's causing too many problems. <laughs> um, so we will move up item 5A ahead of item 4. Uh, I did want to mention that item number 3, public comments, we had no one sign up. And just for the members of the public who are here, um, uh, I wanted to mention that that is different from the public hearings that are going to be conducted on the, uh, the, later on in the agenda in items 6A through D. The public comment section of the agenda is a new uh, portion of the agenda um, that is for uh, general comments about items on the agenda. Uh, speakers for the public comment section are required by our uh, ordinance that City Council adopted last month to sign up at least six hours in advance. That rule does not apply for folks who are here to speak at our advertised public hearings. Um, before we move into the, uh, the election of officers, did want to recognize a couple people here. Uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Reggie Harris, who is our newest Planning Commission member. This is his first meeting. Um, he was appointed by the Marin Council last month, and uh, we appreciate Mr. Harris's willing to serve, willingness to serve, and we look forward to having him on the Planning Commission for many years to come. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> While we are happy to see Reggie here on the uh, commission, we are sad to see Mr. Warren Russell uh, depart our commission. Mr. Russell has served faithfully and dutifully on our commission for many years, since either 2015 or 2016, I believe. And uh, Mr. Russell has been a very valuable member of our commission, um, has uh, brought a um, uh, uh, wisdom and a knowledge and a uh, and has just been uh, very important to our commission over the years so mr. Russell if you wouldn't mind standing up so we could honor you with a round of applause for your service Woo! and without further ado um, uh, we'll move on to the election of chair and vice chair for the year 2023 2024 and so I will ask for a motion uh, for um, our nomination for chair for this year. I make a motion or, or a nomination for Kathy Jones as chair. Second. We have a motion and a second uh, for Kathy Jones to serve as chair for this, for this uh, fiscal year. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations, Chair Jones. Thank you so much. Yes. Appreciate All right. It. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> and before before you uh, take the seat back, um, we will call for a um, nomination for vice chair for this year. You can't wait to run out of that. I chair. nominate Ken Halburn. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Mr. Halliburton, congratulations on serving as vice chair for another year. And without further ado, I will relinquish this seat to someone who can uh, fill it much better than I can. Thank you all, and again, welcome Reggie. 
and Warren, we're going to miss you. And uh, we uh, say congratulations to all the people on the water board who get to uh, enjoy your services from here on. They're very lucky to have you. All right. So our next item of business will be to approve minutes of the June 7th, 2023 and June 21st, 2023 Planning Commission meetings. We've had a chance to review those ahead of time. If anybody has any additions or corrections, please let us know, and otherwise we will be ready for a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor, state aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, next, we will move on to our public hearings for tonight, and we do have four public hearings. Um, for those of you that have not been here, most of you probably have, but for anybody that has not been here, we'll just review again um, our, what we hope to have happen in the, in the public hearings. When we open the public hearings, uh, you'll come forward uh, to speak. You'll come to the podium and state your name and address. Uh, you will have three minutes to make your comments regarding the item you're here to speak about. You'll make all your comments, please, to the Planning Commission and not to other members of the audience or the developers or the staff or just please make all your comments to the Planning Commission. Questions that you have will make note of during the public hearings and then at the end of the public hearings we'll answer all the questions or, or attempt to answer all the questions. <laughs> at the end, because uh, a lot of times we have the same questions may come from several different people. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, tell you the first public hearing we have tonight. Many of these people we've seen before. This is a zoning application for approximately 34.2 acres located west of Memorial Boulevard to be rezoned from RS-15 to PRD. It is Northridge Park PRD. Brightland Homes is the applicant. And Ms. Green, good evening. Good evening, congratulations, Chair Jones and Mr. Halliburton. Our first item this evening is for you to conduct a public hearing on an application our department's received to amend the zoning map for property located west of Memorial Boulevard. And you can see it on the map before you today. The property is in the blue color on the map. This property consists of several parcels that have not been platted as part of a subdivision, and combined they are 34.2 acres, or approximately 34.2 acres. The um, subject property is located south of Regency <coughs> Estate subdivision, east of Regency Park, and north of Palmer Heights. All properties are zoned RS-15, and RS-15 is single family residential district with a minimum lot size of 15,000 square feet. To the east of this property is the Family Worship Center, and a portion of this property is zoned CF and CH. This application does not amend the existing commercial zone on the property. It leaves it zoned as is, and is only for that 34.2 acres of RS-15 to be rezoned to PRD. PRD stands for Planned Residential District, and the PRD zone allows a specific plan to be approved for properties and so that's what you have before you is a program book or pattern book um, titled Northridge Park and that's the request to amend this map to the Northridge Park. Regarding reapplications when denied as Planning Commission are aware that the zoning ordinance says that if an application for amendment to the zoning ordinance or zoning map it does not is denied by council or withdrawn by the applicant after first reading that there is a 18 month period that must um, happen before a reapplication with the same um, information can be submitted. However, the zoning ordinance does allow that application to come back to planning commission in several circumstances. In this instance, the development services director determined that the differences between this overall plan and the previous plan are sufficient enough that this can be come back to the planning commission today and not wait those 18 months and ask that the Planning Commission concur. And the alternative, staff would ask that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council authorize consideration of this plan with the previous Section 6G. And this action is similar to what you've done for applications that have changed in the past, for example, Clary Park. The Northridge Park PRD um, did go to City Council in December of last year. 
the Planning Commission formulated a recommendation to approve that application with several changes made by the applicant, but at the City Council public hearing, it was denied. Today, you have an application uh, made by Brightland Homes, which is the same organization that made the application before, but with a different name, and I just wanted to clarify, if you remember, Guillen Homes was the applicant last year, and this year it's Brightland Homes, however, it's the same organization, so I just want to clarify that. This PRD application is also for single family detached homes, so no town homes or condos or in commercial area. And that, those single family detached homes are approximately 85, or a maximum of 85 of those in this plan development. So the way that our ordinance is written, you can come up with a specific plan for properties that identifies the maximum number of dwelling units. The applicant would not be able to increase the number of dwelling units allowed on this property unless they amend this book. And so in this book, they've committed to having no more than 85 single family detached dwelling units on lots that are a minimum of 12,000 12, square feet. This results in a density of about 2.5 dwelling units per acre, which is consistent with our future land use map recommendation that recommends this property develop with suburban residential developments. And so that is consistent. The developer has offered to um, and put in their book a restriction that prohibits rental of these units for several years. I think it, they want to show the Planning Commission that their intent is to um, create a community and not to create a community to sell to investors. And so within the pattern book is a commitment to restrict the sale of these um, homes <coughs> for rental of units. As I mentioned, the PRD requires a minimum lot size of 12,000 square feet. Each single family home has a minimum size of 2,350 square feet, and that's heated space, and then the, of course the garage is in addition to that. The previous application did have some front-facing garages. Staff encouraged the applicants to not have front-facing garages as we believed it wasn't consistent with a suburban type um, development that is, is um, recommended for this area, so all the new lots on this property will have side or rear entry garages. I, during the process last year, it, we had some questions about under the existing zoning, how many lots would be allowed, because under the existing zoning, single family lots can be developed without um, an amendment to the zoning map. And so if you're looking at the bulk standards and you just divide the acreage, it's 99 lots. However, it's not practical that this property could develop with 99 lots. They um, would need to account for our subdivision regulations, our street specifications, stormwater management, and other type um, development standards. So staff estimates that this property could maybe develop with 70, 75 lots with the existing RS-15 zoning. The RS-15 zoning, of course, wouldn't require an amendment to uh, the zoning map and then would not have any of the additional commitments made in the program book. And so the plan is for a maximum of 85 lots and so it's about 10 to 15 lots more than what we estimate could be developed on this property. <coughs> I think an area um, that we understand is something that Planning Commission City Council discussed last year and then the, uh, neighbors discussed are, is the fact that five streets currently stub into this property. And the city's subdivision regulations and say that existing streets that extend to a land track or which are stubbed out to a land track shall be extended into the land track as the land is developed. And the option if they don't extend is that they can, ex can extend and dead end into a cul-de-sac. Staff didn't believe that cul-de-sacing the streets into this development would be the best option um, based on the traffic study that was in the program book and that you have available for you, that having those streets comply with our development regulations is the recommendation of our staff, and we believe that will be um, the benefits identified in that traffic study will be for the future residents here and the existing residents as well. You do have in the um, program book a summary of the um, stormwater and drainage and a summary of the traffic analysis in addition to the entire traffic analysis. There was some, after, during the uh, process last year, an opportunity became apparent to ask our street department to inspect the existing development. So regardless of this development, our public infrastructure department and our street department maintain and manage existing stormwater systems in Murfreesboro. And so if there are um, opportunities with water 
in people's homes today, that's something that our, um, the city wants to look at regardless of what happens on this property. And so our street department did go out and do an inspection of the site at the request, um, I think, of city staff after hearing some testimony from the residents of the area. And after an inspection of the area, they noticed that some of the old metal pipes had degraded, the bottoms rotted out, and so they upgraded the drainage system under Regency Park Drive and then upsized the pipes under Regency Park and Tower Drive so that they could increase the capacity for the stormwater to go through. Also some maintenance issues with the ditches, they regraded the ditches to make sure they can drain appropriately. All of those are part of the maintenance program that we have with the city with our stormwater program. And um, of course we want that to make sure that it functions regardless of um, whatever type of development happens here. There are also questions of course about the future development and how that would affect the properties. And as you know, we do have a stormwater regulations that future development, whether under RS-15 or the PRD, when it comes back to the Planning Commission for review, you'll have available to you. We require the engineers for this project to develop technical documents that demonstrate that the stormwater is managed according to our regulations. Essentially, it can't make water worse for the neighbors. And so if water currently receives, retains, and releases water, it can do so. Um, but this development will need to make sure to not push extra water on neighbors that's not there or to concentrate the flow. So to have water that normally sheets flows into a large area to go into a very concentrated area. And this is a very routine thing for our staff. I know um, we, with every submittal, the site plan or subdivisions, it's something that our engineering staff looks at and we feel confident that our regulations are sufficient to uh, manage that. But those type documents come later and so the question is often, well, when will you have this information? And um, you'll have it when the subdivision plan, master plan, preliminary plats are submitted for the property, whether it's under the existing R15 or the proposed PRD. When looking at plan developments, we like to um, make sure the Planning Commission understands what the, what the variations or deviations may be in the program book from our regular standards. And so the PRD book does identify a reduction to the front setback. So it says that the, the house can be 30 feet to the street, but it's maintaining the garage 35 feet back. And the reason that's important is because you can get four cars in the uh, driveway with that 35 feet at the garage. A reduction to the front setback um, for houses, increase in the heights, and an increase in the maximum lot coverage. Um, and so those are what were identified in the program book. As I mentioned, the future land use map does recommend a suburban development on this property, and the zoning plan that you have before you is consistent with that future land use map. So it's staff's recommendation that the Planning Commission consider the recommendations of the future land use map in addition to the recommendations of the comprehensive plan and uh, consider the appropriateness of the exceptions requested by the applicants. I know the applicants have a um, PowerPoint available that they'd like to present to you with the specifics of the plan, but before they come up, do you have any questions for me prior to the public hearing? Of course, I'll be available after the public hearing as well. Any questions for Ms. Green before we hear from the developers? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Green. Then I'd like to invite Mr. Roundtree um, to the lectern. You are there. Thank you so much. Chairman Jones, congratulations. Oh, thank you. You had your chance to run. Thanks for staying. <laughs> And now everyone else, uh, my name is Clyde Roundtree with Huddleston Steel Engineering. We appreciate your involvement here. We're happy to present this project. Thank you, Margaret Ann, for walking it through in such detail. This is uh, Northridge Park, as Margaret Ann mentioned. This is a subdivision on a piece of land that's been in a lot of people's backyard for a long time. It's an existing pasture. Um, it's, a, it's surrounded by beautiful neighborhoods, Regency Park, um, Palmer Heights, and Regency Estates. Drove through those neighborhoods today just to kind of savor how pretty they are. And, and these neighbors who are here tonight have been very active in the process and I want to commend them because it takes time out of their schedule to make sure that they're heard. Uh, we've had two neighborhood meetings related to this project. Both were, uh, we considered them successful because we, we gleaned information that helped our project get better. Um, there'll be some concerns that are expressed today that are probably a little bit more global than our site. However, 
we do appreciate all their involvement and in helping us kind of know how to make our plan better. As Margaret Ann mentioned, it's gone through several cycles. We, we received unanimous approval last year from the Planning Commission just to move forward with Council, but a lot of the concerns were over traffic. That's one thing we have to look at on this particular piece. And as Margaret Ann mentioned, there's a lot of stub streets and how we connect to those. That's going to be a topic of conversation tonight. And drainage is also a, a major, major concern. And as Margaret Ann mentioned, as a result of uh, some observations from our team and also from the city, some improvements have been made already on the drainage. Typically on drainage, we tell people that if we have a chance to work with the city on developing a piece of property, that's the city's chance to help us improve the situation. So that's exciting to know that there's some solutions we believe from a drainage standpoint that can further the cause of making sure everything in the area works better. With that in mind, Chris McGuire from Huddleston Steel is here. If you have any questions related to drainage, uh, any questions related specifically to traffic, I'll give a brief presentation of the overview of the project and then I'll be glad to come up after the public hearing if you have no questions for me. And I'm going to hit the highlights because Morgan did such a good job. But that basically it shows you that this piece of property is a large pastoral area, basically less than 300 feet off of Memorial Drive. Uh, the Family Worship Center is the church that's basically to the north, really to the east of this property. But on that top corner, we see that big white box. As far as Regency Estates, that's to the north. To the west is Regency Park subdivision. And to the south is Palmer Heights subdivision. They're all ranch style homes with mature trees immaculate lawns. I mean, it's very well kept. One of the challenges on Palmer Heights is uh, their bar ditches for their drainage scenarios. So those roads have a perception being a little bit narrower than, um, than maybe a city standard street. They are city standards to a level, but there are bar ditches that give you that feeling that they're tighter. Adjacent uses, I'll just go ahead and mention that. So the, the church, the Family Worship uh, Center Church has been fantastic. We've had both of our neighborhood meetings there. We appreciate their involvement in the community. They've been an unbelievable host. We've had active meetings. We have well attended meetings. So I want to give a shout out to them. As far as the proximity of the property, we feel like Memorial Drive is very important from a design standpoint. It allows access to the commercial coming right in front of our property, we have a kind of a flag oriented lot. And then it gives us access to the back portion of the property where all the single family homes are planned to be built. This is our overall master plan, site plan. So what's, what's occurred primarily, and we think there's some great, there's been some great dialogue, but one of the keys that we've made a big change from, originally we have an access point off of Osborne Lane. There's a, there's a, there's a light there, existing light. Uh, we would add a signal for outgoing traffic from our subdivision as well as the commercial development. However, originally we had that going all the way through. We did not have a hard stop right at the intersection of Osborne Lane and the street within the subdivision. So it created the opportunity for a through street that goes to Banner. And Banner goes quite a ways through the subdivision to the, to the west. So working with Chris and the planning staff, we made it much more circuitous to move through the subdivision. That was the major change. It was really based on circulation to make sure there is really no easy way to create a shortcut through the subdivision. We feel like we've been successful in that effort. However, in that process, another concern came up is that originally had the amenity center towards the back portion of the property. And, and there was a lot of concern about that because you're forcing all the people through the subdivision to go to the back. So now we've moved the amenity center towards the front. So that green plot of land right off to the right of the, of the entrance is now the amenity center and the mail kiosk, right on the back side of the commercial, right at the entrance of the subdivision. So Gian Homes is out of Dallas, Texas. They're excited to come to this market. They're really excited. They've been very patient walking through this process. Uh, as was mentioned, at one point we had over 95 homes. We had 20% we had front entry homes. Um, we had the other percentage side entry garages. Gian has agreed to making the whole subdivision site entry garages, which will be consistent with the character of the adjacent neighborhoods because those are all basically side or rear entry garages in the adjacent neighborhood. These homes are a minimum 2,300 feet, 2,350 really, and they're all masonry with a, with a, they call it an upscale trim package. It's more an enhanced trim package. So they believe the starting point of these homes will be around $700,000 is what they think will be the starting price for the homes they plan on building. 
So one of the concerns that the neighbors have had is the impact on their property value. Will this be a negative impact on their property value? We're confident that this will be a positive impact on their property value, that they should see no, in, no decrease in their, their square footage cost based on what's going in here. This is also all single family detached, which is a priority that's been uh, encouraged for us to consider in any planning efforts within the city. We're doing our best to see how many single family homes we can develop in terms of, you know, there's a lot of pressure on homes and still single family detached is something that we all want, but sometimes we can't figure out how to make that happen from an affordability standpoint. But these homes are all single family detached side entry garages. They've modified their plans, uh, you know, where the garages are on the front, as Margaret Ann mentioned, the garages will recess back. So we want to make sure we have enough distance to allow two cars in the garage, four cars in the driveway. So that reduced front setback is just for the volume of the house. The garage would step back. Just bring clarification of that. This is a picture of the mini center with the mail kiosk and the front entry sign. As was mentioned, it's being relocated to the front entry of the whole subdivision. Open space will be the, the kiosk area. The stormwater area, just to let you know, that's a low spot on the property on the back corner, basically on the north uh, western corner. That's been consistent on all the plans because that's really where the natural drainage wants to go. One thing that we're working through with the neighbors, and it's kind of hard to understand, that there's, this is, there's a lot of subterranean drainage. There's piping that's going to be installed as a result of this project. With all the mass grading, there will also be a lot of infrastructure that's built resulting from this project. So there's a lot going on grade-wise right now. The, the property has kind of a role, so it's hard to imagine that that water's gonna go to the right spot, but this will have a mass grading exercise, so we'll be able to control that water, and what we can't control will go subterranean to go to that detention area. So that's just for clarification. As far as the perimeter is concerned, a lot of the neighbors, there's a lot of existing trees around the perimeter, and some of the neighbors want them there, and some of them want them gone. But we told them that typically what we try to do is preserve any existing vegetation around the property lines in order to kind of preserve the natural character and really minimize the amount of disturbance to their lives. But that tree line's really established, so there's some trees that have fallen over and you know just kind of had, just a, some are just dying over uh, from age. So we, are, we want to work with the adjacent property owners to make sure that the developer knows that these are folks that want their, their buffer area preserved. And this one wants the street down, and we told them we'd do our best to work with them. There's a few exceptions on this site where uh, one house has a reduced rear setback. They're here tonight, and we've talked to them about staging our building to make sure that the mass of the home is, is as best we can do related to their home, because they basically back up to one of the lots. It's, uh, they'll point it out later, but it, it, there is a situation where their rear yard is only about 15 feet off the property line. We told them we'd do our best to work with them to make sure the mass of the house is on the, adjust, uh, on the other side of the property line. And hopefully that makes sense. But we're trying to work with the adjacent neighbors. There's also a few neighbors that have pronounced flooding in their yards. And we've tried to do our best to convey to them that we're going to do our best to make sure that they're, they're heard and responded to. But with that in mind, Chris McGuire can help you with a little bit more detail on that. So with that in mind, we do want to introduce street trees along the new roadways, uh, the roadways will have sidewalks on both sides. The current situation in the neighborhoods, adjacent neighborhoods don't have sidewalks, but it's a city standard and we feel like it'll just add to the quality of the neighborhood. We will introduce street trees. If we could do anything that would be wonderful is to get major mature trees that would look like the adjacent neighbors, but it's gonna take time. But after driving through the neighborhood, I'm fully confident that the quality of these homes, the character of the development will be something that they'll be happy with in the long run, it's a change, and we know change is tough. Uh, there's nothing like looking at pasture in your backyard, but we also know change is happening. So I feel like we've listened well. We've done our best to modify the plans in accordance with their concerns, staff's concerns. The client has been very favorable as far as being as flexible as possible, staying in the game with us, even over a, redu a reduction in overall um, homes. But at the same time, I, I think they really want to be here, and they want to make sure it's a quality development. So with that in mind, that's the extent of my presentation. I'm available for any questions you may have. If you have any detailed questions related to drainage or, or traffic, Mr. McGuire's here. And I'd love the opportunity after the public hearing to respond to anything I can. So, thank you. Okay, any questions for Mr. Roundtree or any of the Huddleston Steel team before we open the public hearing? Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Roundtree. All right, with that, 
Uh, we will open this first public hearing. If you'll remember all our little comments we made, and I did forgot to mention that you do have one chance to come to the podium and speak, and once you've spoken, you don't get to keep coming back. So one chance, three minutes. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Uh, my name is Mike Bacon. I live at 2814 Archer Avenue, last house on the right, the very end of the street. Uh, and I've got cards, I'll just read them here, it's easier. Uh, I only want to address Archer Avenue being made a through street. I know you have a system, the street's designed to be a through street, shall be a through street. But first, please can open mind for our concerns. Archer Avenue was designed 50 years ago. It's almost half the size of current street designs and has no sidewalks. No one sitting here today could have anticipated how much Murfreesboro would have grown 50 years ago. And just because the street was laid out one way 50 years ago was not the case to put it through today. Time changes everything. The design of a new subdivision did solve some of the concerns with previous designs. Uh, however, it has created a big one for Archer Avenue. The new design has community bell boxes, or I think you call them kiosks, uh, at the intersection of Archer and Osborne. Again, something none of us would imagine 50 years ago. Now imagine the new subdivision is built along with the new grocery store on Haynes and Memorial is complete. People living in the new subdivision is likely to work in the northwest quarter toward Nashville. All right? So every day these individuals are coming down Haynes. They're not going to go to Memorial and Haynes at the intersection with the new, new uh, grocery store and then on down to Osborne. They're going to turn left on Morgan. They're going to turn left on Archer and buzz right down to their mailboxes. That's going to be the quickest way that they're going to get to their house. Uh, right down the narrowest street of the area. Uh, and uh, another point behind the house on Archer Morgan is the plan for some type of drainage system to support the new development on Memorial, the new grocery store. I know during discussions with Huddleston Engineering at one of the meetings, uh, I was told that there's some thoughts or plans uh, that there might be another road on the other side of that drainage um, that may be Wendell Wood that comes on down through and hits Osborne. So now you've got a street behind people on Archer and in front that now go through uh, and uh, on both sides of the homes. And uh, you know what was told is that would pull some of the traffic off of Memorial. Well, that's exactly what you're going to do when you put Archer through. You're going to pull more traffic off Memorial for everybody of the, of the hundreds of cars that are going to be in that neighborhood. Uh, so uh, because it's going to be a direct shot. Uh, Another item is uh, I've walked all over the adjacent neighborhoods, searched for streets that have this type of impact for a new development, and in no circumstances can I find one that has the potential to create such a bypass from two high traffic areas such as Haynes and Memorial and Osborne area. The design to put Archer Avenue through will drive safety issues and destroy a walking neighborhood, one of the few that still exist that don't have sidewalks. Uh, as for emergency vehicle access, it was brought up at the neighborhood meeting. Uh, we've been there 50 years and during that time had many emergency vehicles that need to come into the area and never with any issues. This was never discussed at the last meetings, but it seems to be a new push looking for a reason to justify that we need to put it through. Uh, I'll end by saying that please do the right thing. There's no benefit about Archer becoming a through street. We can make it a cul-de-sac, whatever you need to do. I understand that the, that the, the property is going to be developed. I mean, that, I knew it when I bought the home years ago. But, uh, you know, we just need to make sure we do the right things for the right reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bacon. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for hearing what I have to say. My name is Ginger Richardson Palmer. I live at 2803 Archer Avenue. I'm deep Tennessee. My family's been here since before it was a state. I live on Archer Avenue and have raised our children there. We love living in Palmer Heights Estates. The reason that I'm here is because of my concern with the traffic that is getting ready to happen in my neighborhood and on my road. I felt that it's very difficult for people to understand unless they see, I'm a real visual person, so unless you see it, see what's going on, 
you know, uh, the new uh, people that are representing this neighborhood talk about how that the roads seem a little smaller. Well, here's the reality. The roads that are going in are 40 feet across. Our roads are 20. Their roads have curb, have uh, concrete curves. Uh, ours have none. Um, they have sidewalks. We don't, and we are a very, because we are an aged neighborhood, we have a lot of seniors, and we do have uh, young families that have moved into our neighborhood, a lot of people that walk with their children, with their dogs, and seniors that walk daily, two or three times a day. But what I'd like to do is come over and kind of explain my concerns, if you'll bear with me. And if you see any misspellings on my map, just <laughs> just kind of laugh to yourself. I appreciate this. I live about right here, which is on Archer Avenue. Okay, so this is what this is what's going in. Eighty-five homes. Well, I figure eighty-five homes times two cars. That's one hundred and seventy cars moving in and out a day. Then they just said, "Oh no." Uh, four cars for the for the driveway. I figure maybe two cars in the in the um, garage and maybe four cars in the driveway. But I just said, hey, what about 85 uh, homes with four cars? That's 360 cars going in and out. If you notice here, I did this um, to represent 40 feet which is what uh, Regency Park is, the new road coming in from Osborne across uh, Memorial. This, uh, this is 40 feet across, they have curved this sidewalk. Wow, that's fantastic. But guess what? In my neighborhood, we have 20 feet across. We have no curbs, no sidewalks. People are going to be coming, oh, I'm sorry. And the mailbox, ooh, they moved it to over here. Well, who's going to be coming off a memorial and coming in here that works? Not many people because there are not many businesses or people coming from Nashville from memorial. No, they will be coming from Nashville, down Haynes, come into Morgan, oh, down Archer, right through here, and right over here straight ahead to get their mail, and then they'll zip up to wherever they need to go. If they don't go here, they'll go straight and take a turn and run in. But I drew this straight, which I should not have. Morgan actually kind of snakes around, so there are a lot of curves. It's curved in Archer. And so it's not super visible. You have to kind of watch your speed because of trees and people walking. On Regency, Regency is 40 feet, Archer's 20. Regency has a turn lane, left or right, and you can come into Regency Park. They want to bring in, uh, they want to come from Amber, which comes into Palmer Heights Estates. But if you notice, this is wide. This is 40 feet to our little 20 feet of Archer, uh, of Amber Road, which is in Palmer Heights Estates. And then they want to move it in so people can come in this way. Well, here's here's an exit off here. This is not named, but you can go in and out of the new subdivision. Nice 40 feet, nice 40 feet power, nice 40 feet uh, onto Regal Drive, and nice 40 feet here. But they want to make from Nashville. People come from Nashville. You can people can go down to Memorial where this where this brand new, here's Kroger, and then they're putting, a, getting ready to put in a new uh, a high V right here. They're gonna come down here and then come down, no. They're gonna come down and they're gonna make Morgan an expressway to come in because they want to get their mail. That could be 360 cars that we see. As I said, I've been here a long time. And the only reason that you ever come down Archer is because you live there. That's the only reason. And any roads in Palmer Heights Estates, we've been there a long time. They're, they're narrow roads. Two cars barely get by them. How's it 
going to be a, a freeway of coming in here, sit down here, sit down here, and get my mail. And then let's not forget about Osborne. Oh, well, we're putting trees in here. Well, that's nice because I'm sure it'll be pretty. Except for what about people crossing into Osborne, coming, coming over to, if this is extended in here, and then taking a left and going out. Okay. It Thank is, you. It is a is freeway. Please mm -hmm. don't let them do that. I just ask that you turn it into a cul-de-sac. Thank you so much for Thank, for thank you. Thank you for thank your for all you do. hard work and your uh, drawing. We appreciate it. Oh, <laughs> thank okay. you. Yeah. Impressive. Okay, who's next? Hello, I'm Beverly Burke. My address is 2822 Regency Park Drive in Murfreesboro. And I wanted to address a very specific issue, not about the development in general, but about the southwest corner. And uh, specifically, this is right behind our house, and it's proposed as lot number 30. So I'd like to talk specifically about lot number 30. And ours is the property that Mr. Roundtree referred to earlier with a very shallow lot down in that corner. Uh, we've been concerned, as many people are, about stormwater drainage. And we, t at the neighborhood meeting, we talked extensively, my husband Rick Moffitt sitting here and I talked to uh, Mr. McGuire, uh, who's the engineer in charge of the drainage, uh, because we had these concerns. and. Uh, he one of the things that he said is that his recommendation was to have a, an open ditch that runs along back behind our fence. And the reason for this is that with uh, storms, the water collects behind our fence and sits there at standing water until it has time to drain out onto Banner. Uh, this is not the same drainage that the work on the ditch addressed. We very much appreciate that work, uh, but this is a separate issue. And uh, so it was good news when Mr. McGuire said that, build a ditch uh, to carry this uh, water and uh, it, it would uh, protect our house. Uh, but my concern is that lot number 30 is drawn as very narrow with the side of that house toward the back of our property. And I don't know, uh, I think that uh, you would need to pay very close attention how they can squeeze in good drain, the good drainage plan with a very narrow lot that the house would prob and driveway would probably barely fit on as it is. And I would not want the good drainage plan to be sacrificed to make sure that the house is squeezed in. So I would question whether that lot is appropriate to develop. Uh, in addition to that, my husband and I have an ongoing concern about the drainage in general, and we're going to be uh, interested as this proceeds uh, as to what the plans are because uh, the, this is a, a current uh, concern in the neighborhood. Uh, one additional thing I would like to add is that I am not opposed to small lot development. But what I am concerned about is how the uh, adjacent properties around the perimeter of the development interact with the smaller lots. The juxtaposition of the large lot and small lot properties can present problems as it does with our house uh, where the back of the house, where our, we have a shallow lot, as I said, and our house is very close to the property line and the side of a new house would just be a few feet away from our house. And a two-story house, these are large two-story houses, we have a one-story house, uh, would loom over and block the sun from our sunroom, block the sun from our pool, and our back patio because it's only a few feet away from our house if it's built that way. Uh, so I would ask uh, very close attention to lot number 30 specifically because of the drainage issue and because of the closeness to our house, which is a, our, our lot is unique in the neighborhood for being that way and you can look at the map and see how that is. And uh, to sum that up, please pay attention to lot 30. 
Thank you, Ms. Burke. Who's next? I'm Kathleen Deneen, and I live at 2810 Archer. My concern is safety. I understand all the other concerns, but safety is my main concern. We have a very walkable neighborhood now, and people use it for such. I can imagine a mother pushing a stroller with a little toddler next to her and the dog on the leash, which we see. How does that fit with a car coming down the street and not necessarily going slowly to watch for people? That's my main concern, and I hope that you will think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Who's next? My name is Karen Bingham. I live at 2903 Amber Drive in um, Palmer Heights. My property is in the southwest corner adjacent to the proposed development. Um, it is the one that floods the worst, I believe, and Mr. Roundtree has addressed that already and did last year. The city has addressed it in some fashion, for which I'm very grateful. But we have not had a torrential rain since that work was done, so there is no evidence to date that a development in this area won't increase the problem. Um, the last downpour in January, I had water a half an inch below my front door sill because I'm the low spot in the neighborhood. I have videos. Um, the work that has been done since then is terrific. I think it has to help but we have not had such a downpour. And I'm, well, I finally bit the bullet and bought flood insurance because I am so concerned about this. Um, and I think there are probably other people in the neighborhood who are. And it, it's, it's hard to describe how anxiety can prevail every time it rains when your house is in a situation like mine. Um, so, I did not know about the proposed drainage ditch that Beverly mentioned, we're neighbors, um, but I would certainly support that and anything that the development can do to siphon off some of that drainage that's been an issue for the last five years when I've lived here. Um, I am also concerned about traffic in the neighborhood, which has already been addressed by a number of people and putting those stub streets through. Um, all, I agree with all the points that have already been made. If you can make cul-de-sacs, that would certainly be beneficial to preserve the integrity of our older neighborhood. Um, and just keep that character that we it's the reason we bought and live there uh, intact. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bingham. I had not planned to speak, but I feel like I need to. I live on Regency Park. And if you open the steps. And your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Jimmy Lederman, 3022 Regency Park. And as the lady told you, Two cars per house is 170. Regency Park is a very busy street. And the mothers that take their children to Siegel Elementary, if you will stand out there some morning, you will see those mothers go down that street at 80 mile an hour, and I am not teasing. They'll drop their kid off at Siegel, they'll turn around and come back down Regency Park at 80 mile an hour. And if you put more traffic on Regency Park by opening these stub streets, you're asking for a disaster and a lawsuit for the Rutherford County, for the city of Murfreesboro, because someone will be killed. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Who else? Anybody else? Yeah. My name is Rick Moffitt. Uh, 2822 Regency Park Drive. Uh, one of the things I'd like to uh, maybe throw out for the commission, and I, I really appreciate the work uh, of the Planning Commission and also uh, uh, Huddleston as well too. They've been really uh, gracious in terms of kind of meeting with us and, and hearing us. One of the things that got floated a while back was with some of the sub, sub streets. I know there's a certain uh, requirement, I believe, with the city for emergency vehicle entrance and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things that was thrown out, but I'd like you to be aware of as well, too, was the potential of having that as a dead-end street, but with an emergency uh, uh, arm that will come up for emergency vehicles. I just wanted to let that uh, be uh, uh, on your minds. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. And we have several items that need to be addressed on here. Um, specific questions from the Planning Commission, or I can start down my list of questions. Y'all go ahead and go. Who's got a question? One of the gentlemen mentioned <clears throat> another road behind Archer uh, that I haven't heard about yet. And someone from staff, is there another road going behind Archer between High V to Osborne being discussed? I don't. I don't think that it's another road behind Archer. But if I can find a map, I will maybe give you that visual illustration that should be able to help you see where that is. So on this map, um, in this location is the um, property that the Planning Commission approved a site plan for a high V grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, behind the grocery store is the um, detention and retention pond. There is a connection to the properties to the north, which are also zoned for commercial purposes. And um, my suspicion is that that's what they're referring to as a street behind Archer, because of course Archer is here. And, and this is not a public street, but it is a cross access, which we um, as staff do recommend with development so that you don't require cars going back on the public road just to get to the adjacent properties. So we oftentimes require cross access agreements and easements, and that's, I think, what he is referring to. So it, it's further towards Memorial, not closer to just the back of the house is on Archer. There's a, there's a detention area right there, correct? There is a detention area. They do have the back of the grocery stores that has right. um, the service area for the delivery vehicles for the grocery store. Okay, and one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was for taking Amber and Archer both off because mm -hmm. I actually went over and met with several neighbors, and while I was standing there, I almost got hit by a car when my truck was in the driveway standing with neighbors and a car came through because the road was that narrow. So I liked the idea of taking both of those off because of the narrowness of those streets. And I just heard Mr. Moffitt say something about the option of a arm for emergency vehicles. So not necessarily taking them off, but taking them off for normal everyday traffic except for emergency vehicles. Is that an option? We don't um, present that as an option for public streets, but for private drives. And I, I have heard some conversation about the widths of the streets and the future widths, and it may be worth um, sharing the chart that I have on the screen with you, just so you can have an understanding of what exists. Um, I just, and if the cable department will pull up my screen, we'll be able to share it with folks as well. You can see that the streets, Tower Drive, Amber Drive, Archer Avenue, Banner Drive, and the unnamed street are all listed. And so what I wanted to share is the approximate widths of those streets. So you can see um, in this first column, the width of the pavement, the driving surface for those streets. What I want to clarify is that right of way is different than pavement width. Right of way is actually the area of land that the city owns. The streets are somewhere within that right of way, but the streets are not the same width as the right of way. So if you look at the second to the last column, you can see that's the widths of the existing rights of way. So our street specifications, and this development will have 50 foot wide rights of way, but the street, the, the street width will be 24 feet. Right. 
So it will not be a 50 foot street. It's a 50 foot right of way, which is vastly different. Yeah. And so when you see like for tower, um, tower is currently 20, approximately 24 feet wide, the pavement, not the right of way, and the new streets will be 24 feet wide. So there's actually not that much difference with tower. The most significant difference is Banner and Unnamed Street because Banner and the Unnamed Street are actually 36 feet of pavement. So when it goes into this development, it will actually neck down to the 24 foot lanes. Archer, um, I, it was about 21 feet wide. And so these streets will be 24 feet wide. So it is not unusual for there to be tapering in or tapering out of streets. And so in this instance, I think there's a misunderstanding of what really is required or our street specifications. So I thought this might be help. And so of course the transition column shows you the difference in the widths. I, I, I appreciate that uh, description. What, what I was, what I've noticed on Archer and Amber we're with the ditches and where these are curb and guttered and sidewalked, there's nowhere for somebody that's parking on the street to get out of the street. They are parking on the roof road top. So you've got a 20 foot wide road with a car sitting there parked in front of their house. There's not two other lanes. So if you've got people walking down the road, there is not enough room for cars, a parked tour car and walkers to walk on that street. I'm not as concerned with the stepping down and the stepping up as I am with just the safety of having that amount of space on a 20 foot road. Sure, I just wanted to share what, what's really there and what really would be the scenario. And it may not surprise you that our sidewalk policy in Murfreesboro, which today is sidewalks everywhere for everyone, when I began working here in 2005 was not the policy. Absolutely. And most subdivisions in Murfreesboro don't have sidewalks. I, as a planner, am an advocate for it, and I would love the opportunity to add them wherever we can. And so my neighborhood doesn't have sidewalks, and I wish that it did. New developments have sidewalks, mm -hmm. and so we, there was a period of time where new developments, we didn't require them to put in sidewalks because there weren't any in the adjacent neighborhoods. And so we said, well, it's a sidewalk to nowhere, but planners advocated, well, no, there may be sidewalks in the future. Let's get them while we can. Consider part, sidewalks a part of a complete street because streets are to move people, not just for vehicles. And so this subdivision, of course, will have sidewalks, curbs, gutters, and so it will have the people walking out of the drive lanes. But um, I just wanted to clarify the pavement because I think last year I heard the same comments, I heard them today, and it just, I think, helps you have an informed opinion about what exists and what will exist there. Sure, absolutely. I appreciate that a lot. Thank sure. you. Can, can you remind us uh, the um, positioning of the mail kiosk in this common area versus the other common area? Did it move from last year to this year? It did move and I'll show you um, if I can, let me find a concept plan that will better illustrate it. I, I feel like it's a similar conversation. People who live on Tower want their street closed, but the other street's open, right. but the people who live on Archer right. want their street, the I'm other street's saying. open. And, and rather than us choosing, well, yours closed, yours open, we just wanted to be consistent with our policies that we've adopted. Our standards are very clear. Mm -hmm. Staff's position is, of course, very clear about making those connections. Um, but in that similar conversation last year, there was a lot of resistance from neighbors who lived near the kiosk that was near the detention pond. Mm -hmm. So I think staff didn't recommend the, the relocation, but the applicant said, okay, we hear that that's not something neighbors like, so they moved it to here. And of course, today there's um, some concern about that location as well. Um, it, was, it was an effort that the applicant did on their own, thinking that they were, um, yeah, they I, were. I do think it ought to be wherever it fits the best and wherever we have the most room for the right number of cars to pull in and out and to park to get their mail. Um, I do feel like whether it's on whichever end it would be on, we would be looking at, at the most, I would think, if there's 85 lots or approximately 85 lots, 85 cars, I don't think we'll have multiple cars pulling out in to get the mail just because there's more cars in the driveway necessarily. Every person in the household doesn't need to stop and get the mail. One person needs to stop and get the mail. They all need to ingress and egress from the subdivision but some of them may not have the need to go in one end or the other, wherever the mail kiosk is, uh, just because 
the mail kiosk is down there. I don't, I don't think we need to think about, I don't, I don't think 360 cars going to get the, the mail every, every day. Um, but I understand that it's a concern either end of the subdivision and just the number of parking spaces that are available for them to stop and get their mail and the egress and ingress in and out of the mail kiosk space, whether we have that set up correctly, I would be more concerned about where it fits better, where it's going to work better. Um, I think the whole mail kiosk situation is still something that we're all learning about. Um, it's a federal thing, I take it, right? It's not something we decided we wanted to do. Uh, and I don't know that we know how they're all going to work and where they work better and how many spaces we need and uh, all of those things. But um, I guess we're all doing, doing the best we can to figure out the new mail kiosk and all of us getting our mail in one central location. Um, I, I got one more. Go ahead. Uh, this is a question for the developer, the uh, or Claude, Mr. Roundtree. Uh, on lot 30, mm -hmm. uh, there is a, uh, I do have a concern with if this house is sitting in the si setbacks and we have a two story house sitting directly on a line with a, with a one story house directly adjacent. Is there a way to meander the driveway where the driveway is actually adjacent to that house on Regency Park instead of the driveway being on the opposite side of that, that way, at least there's the separation of the concrete driveway between Regency Park and that house. Yes, Mr. Wright, uh, we, the developer understands that situation. Like I said, the houses are, the mass in the house, there's a two-story portion, there's a garage portion that's more of a one-story. They've got different kind of models. Mm -hmm. They already know that, because like she's mentioned, because their rear setback's so shallow, we would put the lower portion of the house, which is the garage side, and you're right on. If we can go ahead and put the garage on that side, create distance just by using the concrete, uh, with the side entry garage, that would be our desire, okay. and we're we're working towards that end. I mean, there's, it's not a perfect scenario, but it's it's a, it's a scenario that the developer is sensitive to with the model of home that goes on that particular lot. Okay, awesome, sounds can, great. Can I add one more thing on that? Yes. I, I had a, a question on that too. I, I actually wonder if that particular little three lots wouldn't be better off as two lots, and I think that that ought to be really considered. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I, I'm, I'm good now. Let's see, what else? Um, I take it somebody from uh, staff that can report on to our um, wonderful police department maybe to uh, monitor the Regency Park Drive traffic at school time? We'd be happy to do that. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yes. What else? What other questions and comments do you all have? I, uh, this is kind of a question and a comment in the same vein you know I'm been on the Planning Commission a long time and the whole Stub Street thing um, I mean that's part of planning as many um, exits and entrances you can possibly have is probably in from a, a safety perspective is probably best in playing devil's advocate you know, how many subdivisions of this size that have 85 lots have six different egresses and ingresses? I, and I, I don't know the answer to that, um, that, you know, exists in Murfreesboro. Um, you know, I live in a subdivision. My guess is there's uh, probably close to this number of houses in it, and, and there is, you know, three but that subdivision was developed in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. So, um, you know, and I don't know what the right amount is or what the wrong amount is, um, but that there's a lot of uh, entrances and exits to this subdivision um, for what it's worth. 
Mr. Halliburton, if I may, I think it's, um, from staff standpoint, it's not only about um, people getting in and out of this subdivision, it's providing a network to distribute traffic, not only in and out of this subdivision, but in and out of the neighboring subdivisions. And um, while I mean, there's no doubt that additional traffic will be added to, uh, to Archer, for example, um, the connection will provide folks to the south an opportunity to get to a signalized intersection for safe turn lane movements uh, left onto Memorial Boulevard. And so I think it's, it's about looking at the, the, the traffic network in its entirety and moving traffic um, uh, within de or, uh, from one development to the next and back and forth and um, being able to get people to um, major arterials without having them to make excessive trips onto those major arterials causing that friction on, on Memorial Boulevard. I was impressed with the traffic study and how detailed that was. Even long time in the future, it was more thorough than I thought it would be. I, I do agree with, with all the, the comments and regarding the sub streets and it is quite unusual and I think probably one of the things we rarely look at a potential subdivision that literally is landlocked. You know, normally they're on one side or the other or maybe there's, uh, and, and this, this one it, for all practical purposes for what we're looking at is a landlocked. Uh, piece of property here and so therefore it does have the potential all these stub streets that were uh, put in uh, with the original plan in mind from the planning that was done for these subdivisions however old they are knowing that you needed access to the adjoining properties so I think it just uh, it is a very unusual circumstance that we would have so many uh, stubs into the neighborhood, but uh, I also think if this property had been developed right along with all the rest of this, this is really a good, good plan. And um, you know, I, I like the the street network that's in there. I like the change that was made to keep the um, Osborne to Banner, you know, through Fair going through. I, I, I think. Um, there were some very positive changes made um, from the last time we saw it, even though I, I still approved it the first time we saw it. But um. And I, I'll add on to that. I, I think for comparing this plan to the prior plan, somebody's a lot more likely just to go up to Regal to hit Memorial than they are to go through this neighborhood. Mm -hmm because you just go up Regency, take a, mm -hmm. take a left and a right, whichever direction you're coming from, you hit, go straight to Regal, but it is not signalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's actually 10, including Memorial Boulevard, there's 10 different streets that will provide access there, it's a lot. I'm going to throw a motion out there and see where it goes. Okay. I'll, I'll motion to approve subject to all staff comments, removing Archer and Amber uh, as a entrances. I am not hearing a second. I will second that. that. Okay, I hear a second. Do we have other discussion before we vote? I, I would I would like a, a question just to ask about that. So, how do you choose Amber and Archer versus uh, Tower the, and Banner? The pad width on the actual asphalt. I'm not talking about e the easement. easement. I'm talking about actual pad width, and there is literally nowhere for you to go if you have somebody parked in a, in the street where. Towers of stub coming off Regency. It's only what I don't know, 
50 foot deep probably mm -hmm. Re an unknown unnamed road coming off of regal same thing uh banner looked to be no matter where the plan was it was always going to be a connection road so that's that's where i picked archer and amber and so would you anticipate then or do you have a requirement for your motion does amber drive just go away on the okay. property side and the other one gets cul-de-sac yeah that the the other or the other one gets cul-de-sac the uh, the one on the one on amber uh the gentleman who lives in that house currently if you go to the site his driveway kind of starts right there at the stub and veers to the east mm -hmm. so it could really just do exactly what it already does and then the on the property though yeah on the property just this this street is just going to go away and allow right. more room for those Correct. three lots to spread, to spread out, out. Yep. which might answer the the lot, question for the lot three 30. the for lot 30 yes yep. I, I think that's a and then there's no south side access to the subdivision though right without going to banner and tower and taking regency park drive yep. Also, I'd like to add that uh, the other night I did drive through that neighborhood and um, it is very narrow because I went down the end of Archer and I had to turn around right by the sign. So it is very narrow. However, um, I would agree with you. I don't like that. And it is a narrow street, but more importantly, it is a very dark street because mm -hmm. they have lighting issues there as well. And as far as Amber, um, I agree. Those three lots, uh, 30, will will probably potential have uh, flooding issues. So I would I would suggest that we look at probably asking to reduce those three lots down to two and do away with Amber, and you'll have a little bit more room for those two lots. But uh, I agree with your motion on. Uh, Doing away with Amber and making uh, Archer a uh, a nice uh, cul-de-sac, but I am the new guy. <laughs> we appreciate comments from the new guy. Yes, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Because we do have a motion to vote on. It, Madam Chair, I, I think Mr. McGuire, um, who Mr. is the engineer who designed this. Um, because I think this is probably going to pose some design challenges mm -hmm. to retrofit it. So I think I can almost read Mr. McGuire's mind. I think he would like to um, to ask some questions if that's if that's okay with the commission. Oh. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your time. Uh, Chris McGuire with Tuttleson Steel Engineering. Uh, we did hire an independent third-party engineering company to run an an analysis on the traffic for this development. And uh, one, of the require, one of the recommendations by the study is that we make all connections. Uh, the reasons for multiple reasons. One is if we have multiple connections, we're not point loading any certain connection. So by taking away these connections to Arbor, Archer and Amber, it will end up point loading other roads that are within the development. And two, this would give I understand that they're, and I appreciate their concern with having the additional traffic come through the development, but it will also give them a safe opportunity to get to a light, which I feel that they will eventually come to appreciate. Um, uh, uh, no comments from the audience, please. Uh, as far as the roadway width goes, uh, we are about four feet total, like Margaret Ann said. Uh, it was three to four feet total wider than Archer and Amber, but uh, the 20 foot roadway widths are a county standard, and I believe it used to be a city standard to be allowed to have ditch section 20. So those are pretty standard roadway widths. Um, I know you're correct, when you try to park a car on a ditch section road, you will have issues with people getting past because it's designed to just be traveled on, not, tra not to be parked on. Um, Again, uh, we, we, we worked hard with staff to make sure that we met the current ordinance that required we made all the connections, and, uh, and I, I think uh, we've gotten some positive feedback on the layout to try to reduce the amount of pass-through traffic in this development. 
Um, of course, we're happy to work with y'all however we can, but um, it just wanted to let y'all know that we did have someone run an analysis out of office to determine how we should make these connections as well as work with staff. Um, I appreciate it. If y'all have any questions, I'm happy to answer them while I'm up here. And, and Mr. McGuire is correct. He, they made those connections at, at staff's urging um, as, you know, we wanted to honor the, the uh, major transportation plan recommendations, the uh, design guidelines recommendations, and the street specs. Um, and so as, as for, from our standpoint, um, um, I think we're always going to, to, to that's always going to be our, our starting point from staff standpoint um, as, as we consult with, with um, the applicants and the development community. And, and is there any, would Archer and Amber ever be improved even to the point of curbs or that would be a... That, that would be a, that would have to be a city project and um, it would have to be something. justify it really. Yeah, there, there are, um, you know, numerous ditch section streets in older parts of the community and so that would be a, that would be a um, decision of, of uh, council allocating those funds. I live on one of those, so I know. <laughs> Hard to have parties. No place for people to park. That's right, nowhere to go. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, state aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 We lost. We never lose. Um, <laughs> no. I believe it was four to three. Four no's. Three yeses. But we still don't have a, but we still don't have a motion for the project as proposed. Correct. Yeah. That motion failed. Yeah, you right. keep going. Right. You That's keep going until you get a pass. If, it hasn't passed. Yeah. If it's if it's unclear, we'd be happy to call the roll. If that's if um, it's it's four three. It's four three. Right. Okay. But I'd make a motion to approve with staff comments as is. Second. So we have a motion to approve as is with staff comments and a second. All in favor state aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. And I would take it that's four to three. Is that correct? Chase, where are you at? Oh, I was aye. Nice. Five two. Let's, uh, let's, let, let's do a roll call. <laughs> Somebody. Ms. Jaco, do you mind? Thank you. Chair Jones? Aye. Ken Halliburton? Aye. Jamie Avawater? No. Brian Prince? Aye. Reggie Harris? No. Chase Silas? Aye. Sean Wright? No. Four three. Four three. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that motion passes. Um, I'll say there's, uh, this will obviously still be at council, and you see where your two councilmen are. So uh, there we go. I appreciate all y'all coming out again. A uh, lot, lot of work and long project, but. We appreciate it. Thank you. Next, <clears throat> we will be moving on to item B. We'll let everybody move on out to the lobby that was here for item A. Our next item is a zoning application for approximately 16.5 acres located along Veterans Parkway to be rezoned from CH to PRD, approximately 12.8 acres, and PCD, approximately 3.7 acres. Cornerstone Development LLC is the applicant. Good evening, Ms. Rush. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for asking, Chair Jones. Good evening, 
commissioners. Um, it's good to see everybody tonight. The applicant is Cornerstone Development and they're proposing to rezone the subject property from CH, which is Commercial Highway, to PRD, Planned Residential District, for approximately 12.12 acres to allow for 80 single family attached townhomes and also to PCD, Planned Commercial District, of 3.69 acres to allow for the development of five commercial buildings totaling approximately 23,500 square feet uh, earmarked for retail, dining, and office uses. Just a little background on this project. So um, this property was previously proposed for rezoning back in October 7th, 2020, that was a few years ago, or well, nearly three years ago, um, by the same applicant, and it was for 89 townhome units. After the Planning Commission public hearing, the applicant had placed this project on hold in order to make revisions based upon the feedback that they received from the Planning Commission and to work with staff to improve the project design. Uh, staff had concerns about the lack of commercial that was proposed. Uh, we felt very strongly that the commercial component along uh, the Veterans Parkway portion uh, be included, so they had made those changes. Um, also, there were some concerns with some of the sewer at that time, which have since been resolved. So um, those revisions have been taken into consideration in the new proposals before you this evening. Adjacent zoning um, based upon this aerial to the east is Overall Creek, and further east of the creek is uh, land that's in the county, unincorporated portion of Rutherford County that's zoned RM and is developed with single family residences. The parcel to the north is zoned CF, commercial fringe, and it is uh, earmarked and approved with a site plan for self storage and retail buildings. <coughs> Excuse me. The property to the south is the Kroger uh, Center. It's a shopping center with the Kroger grocery store located at the corner of Franklin and Veterans Parkway. West of the property are, two, are a couple of commercial buildings that have a veterinarian and some other uses. Further west of Veterans Parkway is Villas at Veterans. It's a recent subdivision that was approved for 85 townhomes, I'm sorry, 84 houses, 36 of which were attached townhomes and uh, 28 were detached. Um, one of the things that's really important, obviously, to, the, to our Planning Commission, our City Council, is home ownership. So there is a statement that's contained within the program book that the units shall be sold to individual buyers and should not be sold in bulk to a developer or owner of rental units for operating a rental community. So that text was included. Uh, I'm going to scroll down to site plan so um, if you can show this on the screen so the cul-de-sac bulb would be extended from Veterans Parkway that would be a public right-of-way from the terminus of the of the cul-de-sac bulb and the internal streets would all be private streets and private alleys uh, the houses are fronting onto those streets with rear loaded garage entrances off of the alleys um, the buildings will have either five, six, or four units each. The houses will be approximately 1,350 square feet each. Uh, there will be garages, which will contain uh, parking spaces, a total of 110. And the driveways are 35 foot in length and can accommodate up to 220 parking spaces on those driveways. Mm -hmm. There's also guest parking uh, dispersed throughout the subdivision. Uh, primarily in the streets for parallel parking. Um, there will be a mixture of uh, materials on these units. I'll scroll to the, so here's the front. So it is a mixture of brick and cement board siding. The windows on the front have shutters. There's also flower boxes mm -hmm. under um, several of the second story units. There's also flower boxes and windows in the back as well. You see where the garage entry is there. Uh, there's a variety of amenities that are proposed with this um, zoning, which include a dog park, uh, trails. Can I go back to the, there you go. Uh, the dog park and uh, trails are down along uh, the southeast 
portion of the site. Um, the trail extends around the detention pond. Uh, there's also a playground structure, a pavilion, a fire pit. So a lot of the, the community can congregate down in that area and enjoy views of the creek and some open spaces. The planned commercial, let's see, one of the most important elements I almost forgot to mention of this subdivision is the, the promenades. These are um, two, two pedestrian promenades that extend from the residential portion up to, up to and through the commercial portion. As you can see on the site plan, they are heavily landscaped pathways um, that will help provide connectivity between the residential and the commercial. The planned commercial development portion of it um, has two parcels. One that is located up in the upper northwest corner of the property adjacent to Veterans Parkway. Uh, that would be for uh, typical uses that you often see with a CF zoning district, including a drive through restaurant or other various uses. The four buildings that are adjacent to the primary parking lot are um, really oriented towards pedestrians. So they have restaurants that are sit down or eat in restaurants or they don't have any drive throughs. Um, there'll be retail, a variety of retail uses that generate uh, pedestrian traffic. Um, you can see that the pedestrian walkways continue and extend in between those buildings. Uh, there will also be availability for office space incorporated into that. So the parking for the commercial portion uh, they're required per the zoning ordinance for this amount of square feet to provide 104 parking spaces. What's proposed is 140 parking spaces, so it does meet uh, the zoning code requirements. There are exceptions that are requested as part of this program book for the residential portion. Let's see if I can find it. There were four exceptions requested for the, the PRD portion. Uh, one is along the western portion of the PRD, along the commercial parking lot, would not have a planting yard. So that's this area here. So it's this, a little bit of planting, but it doesn't meet the minimum standards per the zoning. Um, and that is to help encourage and provide that connectivity from the residential to the commercial. Um, and that's a big, important part of this project proposal. Um, they're also asking for an exception to uh, solid waste, that it be handled through uh, trash carts rather than um, a trash compactor. Uh, trash compactors are typically required per zoning ordinance for 75 uh, attached units or more, and uh, so that was an, one of the exceptions that they asked for. Uh, they were also asking for an exception to allow the private roads to have a churning radius um, of 100 feet um, and they provided a truck turning template demonstrating that garbage trucks and fire trucks can make those turns and, and hit the radius within those uh, streets. And then the fourth one is the exception uh, for the two car garage dimensions uh, that they'd be slightly reduced by five inches uh, to compensate for the, the area that they're proposing to develop but that there would be a bump out space within their garages to accommodate for the trash carts so that way the trash carts are still able to be stored inside the garage without um, impeding any of the cars that are parked inside the garage for the PCD or the um, planned commercial district there were also a couple exceptions likewise it's uh, they're requesting an exception for the required landscape buffer D separating commercial from residential. And again, it's for the same reason, that interconnectivity, and also an exception to the planning yard for that same segment, which we usually require at 10 feet minimum. Um, so those landscape areas would be reduced or pretty much eliminated. Now the future land use map, uh, 2035 Murfreesboro Comprehensive Plan, does um, has been recently adopted and it does demonstrate that commercial, the neighborhood commercial, would be the most appropriate land use for this area that they're showing where the commercial is located. So it is consistent for those reasons. And it also demonstrates that um, auto urban residential is the most appropriate land use for the portion to the east. 
So it is consistent for those types of land uses. However, the AUR auto urban residential does have design criteria now in our 2035 comprehensive plan that required um, no more than, I think it was 40%, 20% maximum acres for townhomes and 40% maximum units for the attached residences. So we discussed it among staff and we felt that because this application originally came in in 2020, it was under a different set of criteria. It was under our old 2035 plan. So um, we felt that this was something that we could move forward and recommend even though it's not consistent with the current plan at this time. The applicant's representative is here this evening, will make their own presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions from the Planning Commission at this time or at the conclusion of the public hearing. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Raj before we hear from the developers? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Raj. Jones, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, good evening. I am Brian Grover from SEC. I'm here with Matt Taylor from SEC as well, along with Justin Harney of Parks Group and Joey Menji of Cornerstone Development. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, our rezoning of the Sullivan's Retreat Project. Um, I think you're ready for that wonderful presentation. Um, to re re reiterate just some parts of this, uh, this project is located on the east side of Veterans Parkway, uh, just north of the uh, existing Kroger. Uh, closer look at this, you can see the lot for the majority of it is vacant. Uh, there's some wooded area on there, but uh, a minimal amount. The current zoning is commercial highway, uh, surrounded on the north side with the commercial fringe. Similar as Marina stated um, to the Villas at Veterans Development, just to the southwest of the project. Uh, this one is proposing the residential portion onto the, uh, would be the east side of the project away from Veterans Parkway with the commercial front loaded closer towards that main roadway. Uh, some existing site photos. This is looking at the entrance of the project east into the site. Um, as I said before, it's probably just a vacant lot with some wooded areas. Uh, this is looking into the site from the south side or the southeast corner of the lot. Uh, some photos of the existing area. I'm sure most people are familiar with some of these areas, the veterinarian clinic, Kroger's, the dentist office, and the uh, new, I believe it's a physical training consulting company over here on this corner. Uh, the project itself is two parts, the PCD and the PRD, approximately 16.46 acres in total, with 12.12 acres being dedicated to PRD uh, for a total of 80 units on that 12.12 acres, and the PC being 3.69 acres. Access to the site uh, is primarily going to be through Veterans Parkway. Uh, the commercial uh, we'll be utilizing the same access as the townhomes to and from the site. An existing uh, light does exist at the shared access of Kroger onto Veterans Parkway. And the proposed commercial buildings will have access to the shared drive that currently exists behind this veterinary clinic uh, and these two smaller uh, retail buildings. Uh, Part of staff's concern was making sure that we had uh, appropriate radiuses on the radiuses on the site. Um, so we provided and will provide it at site plan level well a uh, template uh, to reassure that all these radiuses do meet the standards and necessary uh, turn radiuses for emergency vehicles. The proposed PRD 
um, as I said before, is approximately 12.12 acres with 80 units for a total of 6.6 .6 units an acre. They will be uh, townhomes on a horizontal property regime and have some of the standard features with some of uh, the common subdivisions, such as the underground utilities and all members will be part of an HOA. Um, some of the key aspects with this development and how it changed and what we're trying to provide is a walkable community. Um, and this was succeeded with the addition of the pedestrian promenades going through the center of the site, um, going to the west into the, the PCD portion of this project. The northern part of the PRD will provide a buffer to help uh, minimize any impact on those properties to the north. The architecture of the buildings um, would be approximately about 1,350 square feet. Uh, they'll be at least all, they'll all be two-story homes, have three bedrooms. Um, and all homes will be alley loaded. One of the goals of this design was to uh, have the homes front onto the internal streets and make this more of a kind of an urban feel to it um, for the residents. Here's some of these elevations of the architecture. As you can see, it's primarily uh, brick and cementous um, material. Um, the homes will have a minimum of uh, three foot landscape foundations around the buildings. Here's a uh, perspective of the rear of the unit. Um, the garage doors will be decorative in nature and have windows. Uh, driveways for two car garages will be a minimum of 18 feet wide with these single car garages being a minimum of nine feet. And the side elevations will continue to carry that material around the side um, to provide that um, elevated look. Some of the amenities that the PRD is providing uh, for this area, uh, monument sign upon entering the site. Um, here is some example photos of what could possibly end up being uh, the promenade within this portions of the PRD. And here's a close up of the amenity area within the PRD. This provides a pavilion and fire pit combination area for residents to enjoy, as well as a pet park and playground uh, for the younger residents as well as their pets. The PCD to the west um, is separated into two lots. Lot one um, is proposed to or has the option to have a drive-through, uh, while P the lot two um, primary aesthetic is more of a plaza and urban uh, shopping experience. Um, part of the key aspect of these two is the continuation of that promenade coming from the PRD portion into the PCD. Uh, rather than list all the uses available, um, we do have some prohibited uses that we, d that we do not want to see within this development, um, primarily beer store, liquor store, gas station, uh, and the such. And when it comes to the lot two of this development, there would be no drive-throughs on lot two. That would be primarily restricted to lot one. The architectural characteristics of these buildings, uh, in order to help provide and define uh, a shopping experience, the entries will be well defined uh, with their architecture. The materials will primarily consist of brick stone and cast stone, as well as some synthetic stone. Uh, and all buildings will comply with the Murfreesboro Design Guideline standards. Here's a perspective of the overall uh, PCD portion for lot two. You can see where some of these architectural elements begin to help define some of these pedestrian areas within this. Um, the shared access road going across the buildings can be seen here. Uh, with this style of architecture and the streetscape and the pedestrian walkways that are provided, um, it begins to create a pedestrian spaces and experiences throughout this site. Uh, that we believe will make it unique to this area. Uh, here's a view of the parking area along with the townhomes.
to the east, you can see how this begins to transition from the PRD to the PCD. Uh, a common aspect that is found within the PRD is the side street parking. We wanted to incorporate this to help bring that transitional feel from the front of these homes into the PCD. Along this side as well, we will include um, some shrub plantings and help delineate the difference between that PRD and the PCD zone. Here's an example of some of that store frontage um, being well defined and um, presenting itself to the to the street. Um, this is the other side of the PCD, same thing. Uh, as I talked about earlier, some of the plazas and seating areas that'll be in this development, um, they will have ample landscaping uh, as well as some other um, seating arrangements such as seating walls and benches and cafe style seating uh, for the potential end users uh, within this development. Um, here you can see this is a perspective of where the promenade ends into in between uh, building A and B. Uh, you, you really start to see that strong connection to the PRD portion of the project as well as some of these elements that are offered to uh, the users uh, of this PCD portion of the project. Here is a plan view of that plaza. Uh, you really get to see the amount of open space and landscaping and uh, opportunities that individuals have as they're shopping through this area. Um, it definitely we're shooting for an urban aesthetic to this um, so people can enjoy their experience as they're going through this uh, area of the PCD. And here's just an example of some of those elements that we found in there, some of the planters, tables, uh, and seating walls as well. Um, overall, Sullivan's Retreat, you know, it, it provides an opportunity to strengthen the Veterans Parkway commercial corridor um, with uh, also providing opportunity for some urban type residential uh, homes uh, within this development as well. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them now or at the end of the public hearing. Questions or comments before we open the public hearing? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we will open the public hearing and ask anybody to come forward that would like to speak in regards to this zoning application. Anybody? Okay. We will close the public hearing. So then I do have a couple of questions. Um, I, I was just wondering in general on the it says all of the residential uh, townhomes are three bedroom units? Um, correct. And some of them are one car and some of them are two car? Yes, ma'am. Do you know, kind of looked like maybe there was two car garages on either end and the four in the middle were one car garages? Correct, so the end units are two car garages with the center units being one car garage. The uh, parking calculations, uh, when we went through those, we definitely want to make sure we had enough parking for everyone. So that's why on all the internal private streets, we do have that on-street parking, um, not only to provide uh, the additional parking necessary for residents and their guests, but also uh, elevate that urban aesthetic with the streetscape for the residents as well. And so like in a one-car garage, how many, they can park one car in the garage and two behind that? Two in the driveway. Two in the driveway and all single file, I take it. So they got a last one in, has to be the first one out. Right? Yeah, um, that is something uh, we can discuss with the client and we can uh, look at reevaluating that to make that a wider driveway. Because I'm just guessing if you're also using the the guest parking up front for your residential parking take up some of those lots, uh, some of the parking calculations. 
do we end up with any guest parking or? So uh, Matt Taylor from SEC. So we've got all of the parallel spaces on site will be available for guest parking. And so between the garages and the driveway spaces, we have more than what the required parking is. And so um, we have used this exact same parking set up at uh, Jackson Town. I think we also did something similar at West Wind. The footprints were a little bit different at West Wind, um, but uh, they all have the single file um, where you stack two cars in the driveway, which I think is exactly what we've asked people to do. Okay, and I guess those are working yes. pretty well. I drive by Jackson Town at least twice a day, and I have not, except for Saturday and Sunday. I try not to come to town then, but mm -hmm. um, I have not seen an issue there. And, uh, and so, and then the parking on the commercial look to all be in the back of the buildings as well, correct? And those four buildings are all like 14 or 15,000 square feet each? Uh, no, those buildings range um, from, I think it's 5,200 to less than that. So the total amount of square footage for both lots was about 23,500 okay. square feet. Okay. That, but that was for the lot one and two. Okay. Um, the, I'll bring it up here just a second here. The actual square footage for these buildings. Uh, so building A and B were about 5,750 approximately, and building C and D, the two ones on the south side, were 4,250 square feet. So they are nowhere, they're okay. not 10, 14,000 square feet okay. apiece, no. Um, combined, you're looking at still um, about 20,000 square feet. Okay. How many um, parking spaces are there at the mail kiosk? I couldn't see that on the... Yeah, I can pull that up real quick here. Um, the mail kiosk has um, approximately about three, three to four spaces. Three spaces, one handicap space. Um, typically, we follow the USP, USPS guidelines for parking on that, um, and um, I believe it's we're actually meeting the requirements for that. But what we can work with staff to make sure that we're meeting at least at least min meeting that minimum amount of parking. We, there's, there's no minimum number of parking spaces for the mail kiosk in our in our regulations. Um, it's, it'll vary. You know, some people don't get their mail every day. Some people are going to walk to the kiosk. Um, you know, considering the number of units that are in proximity to it. So generally, for a development of this size, we would we would require that they provide about three or four spaces. I think it usually. I think it looks small. It does. Ken, because we're used to surface guest parking in addition to the kiosk parking, but this has all parallel guest parking, which I really, really like. But I'm with you. It looked really small on its face, but I think for its purpose, it's not meant for guest parking. It's meant for kiosk parking. Mm -hmm. um, and for the record, I really like the parallel guest parking here. So great job on that. I think that's a much better look to the development than a big surface guest lot every 10 or 15 houses. So good job on that. Yeah, the transition from commercial to residential, the walkability that these people are gonna have to just walk to the commercial piece, um, for that matter, to Kroger. Um, I just, uh, I really like this plan. I do too. I do as well. Go in the right direction with having the uh all the commercial there and then yeah adding as opposed to having the residential and then trying to add the commercial right mm -hmm. that doesn't work that way so very nice well if there are no more questions or comments i'll move for approval subject all staff comments second <clears throat> and second all in favor state aye. aye aye any opposed thank you very much thank you great job thanks all right our next item is a zoning application for approximately 0.64 acres located along East Vine Street to be rezoned from RS8 and CCO to PRD and CCO. East Vine Manor PRD, 520 Vine Street LLC is the applicant. Ms. Smith, good evening. Good evening, Commission. Um, as you mentioned, this particular property is located on East Vine Street. Um, 
getting to the right page. There we go. Uh, as you can see on the screen, it's uh, located in between South Highland and South University Street on East Vine. And its uh, location is adjacent to another uh, PRD that was approved a couple of years ago. Uh, and on this property, they are proposing to put five single family attached townhomes, two in the front, three in the rear of the property, uh, which would equate to about 7.81 dwelling units per acre. Uh, as you can see by this uh, exhibit, it is surrounded by uh, RM16, RS4, uh, RM16, and RS8 uh, zone districts. The RS8 is across the street to the north and directly to the west of the property site and all of those other districts. It is also located within our city core overlay district as well. Uh, as you may recall last time as we gave a brief introduction, uh, we showed the plans and the applicant will be sharing portions of the PRD book, uh, but the things that we would like to focus on is what our land use plan shows for this particular development. Uh, as you'll notice here on the PRD page, uh, future land use plan, this now includes our new uh, land use map information on it. Uh, so you'll notice based on that, it is uh, one of our areas that's in the mixed form housing. This mixed form housing uh, generally includes compatible districts of RS10, RS8, RS6, RSA2, RSA1, RSA3, PRD, RD, and PUD. Lots of options. Uh, so what they are proposing here, uh, staff believed was uh, comparable to an RSA2 district and based on that particular district, there's only one exception that the applicant is um, asking for in their planned development. As you can see by the layout here, uh, that front line, you'll notice there's a yellow dash line along the frontage, and it shows seven foot porch encroachment line. And what that means is our current zoning ordinance in any of our residential districts allows up to a five foot encroachment into the front yard setback. So think of the house, primary structure, conditioned space, unconditioned space can go five feet in front of that line. Uh, based on our CCO, that front line would have normally been set at a 20 foot line. So the house is at 20 feet as our CCO would require, but they're asking to encroach up to seven feet into that zone, which is a two foot variance. Um, otherwise, they are not requesting any other exceptions in this particular um, district. This mixed form housing district is also the district that talks about including porches, windows, awnings, uh, and that there never be more than four units in a residential building and that the uh, building resembles traditional single family residential buildings. So uh, as you saw on the front slide, uh, the front looks like a single home, but it's a duplex. And then there are three units on the back side. And then this is probably a newer exhibit that you might not have seen in some of our plan books but I think it uh, very clearly shows the number of parking spaces per unit. Uh, we have three for each, basically single car garage and two surface, plus an additional two guest parking spaces. And then we've also asked them to locate the trash cans, HVACs, which a lot of times we don't think about until later. Uh, and then more recently, we're also making sure that we can accommodate those gang vaults for our water resources department because they are getting to be tight sites. Um, so with that, um, I would like to call up the applicant. And again, you can see the entry points here with the red lines uh, in the front, sharing a walkway coming up to the front of the house if they are entering from the front. And then the back units, their front facing entryways with the garages and then this project site does also include 
both formal open space, as you can see in the rear of the property, as well as the 50 square foot of private open space through patios or porches uh, in this plan. So with that, I would like to turn it over to the applicant, make sure I get the right one, there we go, for this scheduled public hearing. Hello again. Uh, I am Brian Grove from SEC. I'm here with Matt Taylor from SEC and Travis Lytle of uh, 520 Vine LLC. Uh, thanks again for giving us the opportunity to present this project to you of the East Vine Manor. Uh, as stated, the site is located uh, just south of the East Vine Street and east of South Highland Avenue. A closer look at that, uh, the site is undeveloped as it sits now. Um, it is zoned currently RS8 with a uh, very similar PRD to the east of this. Um, you'll see quite a few similarities between those two uh, products. Um, just to quickly go through some of this, this is the site photos. This is looking into the site from East Vine Street. Uh, this is looking towards East Vine Street from the rear of the lot. This is looking east uh, from the proposed entrance along East Vine Street. Um, you can begin to see there, um, there's a sidewalk that this development would be connecting to. This is the existing PRD to the east of the site. Uh, there's quite a few similar characteristics between these two developments, um, primarily the orientation of the buildings in the center of the site with the front buildings along East Vine Street facing directly onto um, the frontage and the rear units having the garages face the center of the site, therefore kind of eliminating any type of rear unit facing an uh, adjacent parcel. The proposed PRD consists of five units on uh, 0.64 acres for a total of 7.81 units per acre for density. It would be a horizontal property regime consisting of townhomes. Uh, it would have the standard underground utilities and members would be part of an HOA. Um, just like um, the previous presentation, uh, the homes in this development would be restricted to being sold to individuals and not sold in bulk to any type of um, um, investor group or anything of the such. Um, another aspect of this project uh, is there, there's some nice delineation between the private and public driveways within this project. Uh, the driveways will actually be uh, pavers um, for two reasons. One, uh, water quality control. Um, if that becomes an issue, we could easily incorporate those as permeable pavers into the, permeable pavers into the site. Uh, and this also helps differentiate between the private and public realm within the um, project. Uh, included with this is also a strong amenity package. For five units, uh, you've got a pavilion, a fire space area, and seating areas. <coughs> it's a uh, very strong package for the amount of units that are within this development. Um, the parking, as stated before, we have uh, one car garage and two outside. There is two guest spaces over here that are adjacent to the proposed mail kiosk location on the site. The architecture, the, the buildings will be limited to about 35 feet in height. Uh, this was an error on my part. Th this, it, the buildings would be a minimum of 2,000 square feet. That is what the PRD states uh, on page three within the introduction. Um, that was just an error on my part. So they would be 2,000 square foot minimum units. They would be two-story homes consisting of three bedrooms. Um, and, and as stated before, the units along East Vine Street would have rear entry garages. So the fronts of the homes could face onto the street with the rear units having garages facing towards the center to help el eliminate any type of garage facing adjacent units. 
example of some of the uh, architecture for the site. This is the unit at the East Vine frontage. Um, part of the future land use plan for this area dictates that these homes, uh, if they are attached, need to have a neighborhood characteristic. And this is achieved, um, as you can see here, uh, along with the addition of the porch to match the existing uh, architectural style of the neighborhood. This is a rear elevation of the front unit. Um, you can see the, the garages in the rear here. And the rear unit, the three unit building, um, this is pulling into the site. This is what you would see. You would see these garages here with the front facing the property to the south as that elevation. The amenities for the site, um, here's a picture of a proposed pavilion or an example of such along with a fire pit. The western and southern perimeter of this site would provide a buffer and with that buffer there would be a new fence. There is an existing one on site but that would be replaced with a newer style fence. Uh, part of the CCO district is to include private open space, at least 50 square feet per unit. This was achieved through the front and rear areas of the homes, as you can see here in blue. Access to the site uh, is just going to be a shared access drive right onto East Vine Street. Um, and all members of the development would just have access to that drive. Uh, overall, this development, um, it complements the characteristics of the surrounding area and the proposed architecture strives to create that single family home appearance within this neighborhood. Um, and we believe it will be a kind of a great addition to this area of Murfreesboro. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those now or after the hearing. Okay, any questions? Before we open the public hearing. Okay, thanks very much. Yes. All right, we'll open the public hearing and ask anybody who would like to come forward to speak regarding this zoning application. Anyone? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Any other? Comments or questions regarding this application? Me? That's the next one. Me. You want? If not, we're ready for a motion. If there are no questions or comments. I'll make a motion that we approve, subject to all staff comments. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You made a motion. I made a motion. Second. Oh. We have a motion and a second. All in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. Our last public hearing tonight will be a zoning application for approximately 1.2 acres located along North Manny Avenue and Lee Street to be rezoned from OGR and CCO to PRD and CCO. Manny Estates, PRD. BNA Homes is the applicant. Ms. Smith. Good evening again, Chair Jones. Uh, as you can see on the screen above, and let me hit the little clear button, get the scribbly off. Um, the property uh, is located between North Manny Avenue and Lee Street, but it is north of East Bell Street. Uh, the property does involve five parcels. Uh, this portion of a parcel here is actually a commercial lot on the front side uh, where they're going to parcel off the back portion as being part of the PRD project. Um, it's really split into two separate sections, what we'll call the Manny Avenue frontage areas and then the Lee Street frontage areas. We've kind of uh, broken it down because they're two different housing types. Uh, staff was very happy uh, to work with the applicant and see this mixture of single family detached homes on individual lots of record on North Manny Street 
whereas the portion that's on Lee Street has the townhome product where you have a three unit building in the front, a four unit building in the back, uh, and we've broken it out that way. With the four single family detached lots on approximately 0.61 acres, that would be about 6.55 uh, units per acre density, and the seven townhomes are on 0.53 acres, and that would equate to approximately 12.07 units to the acre. Uh, because those townhome units are less than eight units, they are not required to have formal open space under our CCO standards, but they are required to have the 50 square feet of private open space for their project, uh, which they are incorporating through either front porches or back porches on those two specific buildings. Uh, in looking at the project site, um, as it comes to our general plan, again, we have our new <coughs> general plan in place, and these two maps here show two things. The one on the left is what you'll see on our uh, land use map. We don't have the new layers yet, so we anticipate a cleaner version of this map would be in place, but those lots that face onto Manny Street actually have two designations. They have one that's called Neighborhood Compatible Overlay, and then they also have the North Highland Study Overlay, whereas the Lee Street side only has the North Highlands Overlay. So it's a little bit confusing <laughs> as far as trying to uh, better explain that, and then the map on the right side uh, where it shows that yellow, really the, uh, as you zoom in closer, uh, the Lee Street ones have that single family residential designation, and that's one of the reasons that we see those single family. Whereas on Lee Street, it has uh, a different designation referred to as da, 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 mixed residential neighborhood. Um, so, in looking at those two specifically, last time when we introduced it to you, uh, we did have a couple of changes on the single family residential side. Uh, so when we looked at it originally, they had four um, exceptions that they were looking towards, and we had determined that an RS4 district was more appropriate to compare it with because those lots were uh, at 6,000 square foot minimums, but looking at the width of the lots, uh, we determined that would be the most um, compatible comparison in that district. So based on those specifications and then working with the applicant further on this new neighborhood compatible overlay, it's something new that we haven't had to work with before, uh, but really it tries to look at no significant change in development type or pattern. And they're looking at setbacks, um, lot sizes, um, avoiding excessive non-conformities. Uh, so we were able to uh, push the main building envelope back to the 19.5 foot average CCO front setback and then have the normal five foot porch encroachment so that we don't need an exception there. Uh, that would meet city standard. And then the second thing that uh, Matthew was able to catch during uh, the review is all of these back detached garages actually fall under our accessory structure portion of our ordinance, which allows all five foot spacing off of the property line. The only caveat to that is it doesn't take up more than 25% of that area. These take up closer to 60% of the area and partially it was to better separate those two uses. If you have a solid garage with very small fence line, you're not, um, you're not as close to the townhome type uses for those single family detachments. So instead of asking for a five foot rear yard setback, we're asking for an exception to how much of a building can be in that, what's called the required rear yard setback. Uh, so we think that that's more appropriate. Uh, it's still an exception, but it's no longer a five foot setback on the rear for structures for the house, 
but it's the regular 20 foot. So again, uh, not needing an exception in that area, but a little bit hard to understand because this is new policy that staff is working with. Um, and then uh, looking at the townhome development, uh, they are requesting uh, four requested exceptions uh, in that particular area. And again, that's in what we call a mixed residential neighborhood, which has no more than four units in the buildings. And then um, when you're looking at, they're encouraging porches, fences, hedges, awnings, window detailing. And the, the biggest hangnail was uh, if it's a multi-unit building, it should be designed to resemble a single family detached house. Um, and so that particular one, the applicant has asked for that to be an exception. So looking at this drawing here, you can see in that top left, that would be the uh, current proposed front facade that would face the street. Uh, so staff, that is the one exception that staff believes still should be worked on based on the policy, uh, given that the city adopted, excuse me, they did the 2017 North Highland study, developed policies that they would like to see implemented, and staff is looking at how do we implement that policy. Uh, so we think that uh, the exceptions being asked for with the ex as long as that front facade can look more like a single family detached home uh, could be supported based on the policies that we've read in the uh, ordinances. But we do have a presentation that will be given by the applicant this evening uh, to go over more of the specifics of the project. But I wanted to be able to focus on kind of the changes on the exceptions and what the general plan and the comparative zone district shows. So uh, there is a footnote in here, that 20 foot rear yard setback, we didn't catch it on all of the pages. So that is the other thing, making sure that that modification is clear all the way through, not just on two or three of the pages. So I wanted to make sure to highlight those. But with that, let me see if we can find that presentation. It's one, of, it's one of the PowerPoint files on the bottom. Okay, I think it's this one. It's that. Oh, it's Northridge Park. Here we are. All right. Mr. Roundtree. Thank you, Holly. Chairman Jones, commissioners, my name is Clyde Roundtree with Huddleston Steel Engineering. Thank you for the opportunity to stand before you to talk to you about Manny Estates. Um, I'm accompanied by Mr. Brian Burns, who is the developer on this project, and Chris McGuire is here representing the engineering. If you have any specific questions related to that topic. As Holly mentioned, this is a um, it's an exciting project because uh, Brian's done a really good job of doing info projects throughout the city. This is really kind of catalyzed by the CCO, which I think has been really successful as far as revitalization of downtown. Uh, Brian's been kind of a leader in that department as far as getting ahead of that and trying to make sure that there's a quality product that is walkable to downtown. So this would fit in that, that situation. I think I'd like to bring to your attention that as far as this project's concerned, it's kind of unique. We hadn't had one where you kind of breached two different streets. Uh, North Manny Avenue would be, you know, have a more of a single family residential character. Um, a little bit more of a, um, larger homes along, along North Manny. As far as Lee Street's concerned, definitely a different character along Lee Street. So that's why we moved the townhomes to that side. Brian has had a successful project down the street on Lee Street that's done real well. Uh, there's been some work been, that's been done, it's been referenced, actually the homes that we're referencing um, in this book are from the Lee Street project. So with that in mind, just want to help you understand why we have two diverse projects or product types on the same, on the same project. I just want to focus on the site plan, I really, well, I will bring up some existing conditions. This is interesting, as Holly mentioned. 
Um, there's the Crying Cat, Cat bookstores on the corner. So this is kind of neat because not only is it kind of a infill project with residential, but it's also surrounded. There's a church to the north. There's you know a retail shop on the corner on the south west corner. Uh, there's another commercial building right now that's we're not sure exactly what they're using it for, but it is a commercial use. And then you have the doors of Hope Ministry, um, so it has a real kind of eclectic feel from a neighborhood standpoint. Uh, the homes across North Mandy are kind of traditional craftsman homes. Uh, most of them have been restored in this particular portion of the street. As you go further down North Manny, there's a few homes that still have the character but haven't quite had the energy put into them that have happened across the street from our project. As far as uh, on the back side on Lee Street, that's, that's kind of a, a hit and miss as far as the home quality, as far as if it's been developed or not. So the context on this project is important uh, for us, and we, we did our best to try to be sensitive to that. But understand the, the differences between North Manny and Lee Street. Pretty important. These are the above pictures. That's the crying cat on the top left as far as context. The blue building in the center is the commercial building that's going to remain. And there's a driveway between the crying cat and that blue building that's referenced. There's a, you can't see it on that bottom left corner. There's a picture. There's a, a detached garage on that blue house that's in the back that will be removed as part of our lot swap from the commercial to the residential. Across the street, the blue house on the corner uh, on the top right is really kind of the character of the homes across the street. That would be a larger home across the street. However, you can see the quality of redevelopment. And then the, on J, there's an existing beautiful home that's on the corner of this development. It's not in our pie, but it's something to reference. It hasn't been fully restored, but it has a lot of cool architectural character. Our product is, uh, on the, as Holly mentioned, the four homes along Manny will have a craftsman character. We'll go into the pictures on those and then the seven on the rear of the townhomes. So this is the type of home we're proposing along North Manny. All the craftsman details, all would have front porches, exposed rafter tails, you know, decorative porches, lots of brackets and, you know, everything that makes craftsman craftsman will be very much the character of these homes. And the nice thing about the Craftsman home is that even if it's a new home, you can make it look well within the context of the Craftsman character. So we feel like it's appropriate with the design to kind of go exactly with the theme across the street. This is another Craftsman style home that is one of the product types we're looking at, home types. Another one as well. So very fitting within the context of the neighborhood. As far as Lee Street's concerned, that's, that's the townhomes on the back portion. Um, as I mentioned, they've been built down the street with success. However, as Holly mentioned, um, the ordinance is really suggesting through the North Highland study that the unit that's facing the street look like one residential unit. And Brian and I have discussed that in detail. He may come up and give you his feedback on that. The issue we're having with that is that it, it can work if there's only two units on the front. When you get into three units, it becomes a really big single family house, which we're struggling with that. We've added front porches on this, which is different from what's going down the street. There are no front porches. So we try to bring in a little bit more character in to give it a more craftsman style. However, we're really wrestling with what it would look like if it was just one single family house. Because I think all of a sudden that becomes out of context along Lee Street. So Brian can give you more insight on that. But we do have a lot of detail on the front elevation uh, as was mentioned on the rear, you're going to have front-loaded front garages on the rear. So you will see those garages from the public right-of-way, but they're recessed back in the back portion of the property. That front porch is acting as our formal private open space, as Holly mentioned. So just want to bring that to your attention. And we are proposing on the townhome side to have a type A buffer where there's green surrounding the property development as well as fencing. The red is showing where we want to have privacy fencing to kind of create separation between the two developments, but also create some privacy between the commercial and the residential. With that in mind, I'm available for any questions you may have. Mr. Burns is here in the audience and love to answer any questions you may have as well. Okay, any questions for Mr. Roundtree before we open the public hearing? Okay, thank you very much. That will open the public hearing, ask anybody to come forward that would like to speak regarding this zoning application.
first of all, um, I'm Bonnie Black. I live at 513 North Manny Avenue, so I'm directly across the proposed four single-family dwellings, Craftsman style. And I wish I had been able to see this plan ahead of time and that the builder would have called a neighborhood meeting to get some feedback. That's what happened when the Demases wanted to change their property on the corner of Manny and Bell and got buy-in from the people that live and are impacted by the property. That's one thing, that it's hard to think on your feet when this is the first time you've heard about this plan, although we got a notice of the hearing and that's why some of us, is, some of us are here. So I just wanted to say a couple of other things that Manny Avenue from Lytle North to Oakland's Mansion is the oldest housing development in Murfreesboro. And my house was built in 1876. It sold for $800 when the plantation was impoverished and needed to sell off the house, the lots that were the entrance to the plantation. It's really dear to my heart. I've lived in that house as, as an owner-occupied house for 29 years now. And we, we want to see the neighborhood increase to, to be more single family dwellings for people to take pride in their property. And I know that this neighborhood fell into disrepair at one time. You know, it, at one time it was a very good neighborhood and then it fell into disrepair. It's, you know, there's a lot of slum landlords in the area, just a background. The other thing about Manny Avenue is that Lee Street is one street over. That's only one block over and they're deep old blocks. So it isn't like a different neighborhood that should be considered differently. I walk that area often, almost daily. I pick up trash. Lee Street is not a good neighborhood when you, go, when you approach Robert Street. People don't take pride in that neighborhood. There's lots of trash every single day. I'm the bad person that's, re that's calling and, re and reporting people to codes because of the stuff that's just thrown out. Um, on Manny Avenue, on, on my side of the street, there's on the corner Demas's, I share the driveway. It was horse and buggy when it was established. You know, and it, it's hard to stack cars. Believe me, I had two teenagers. Um, single family, family dwelling. There was a single family dwelling that's multifamily next to me. Um, the Chambleys live in the, the blue house that's two-story, they couldn't be here. Peter Demos couldn't be here tonight. Um, Judge McFarland owns the rental on the corner, and then acro across the street, um, Catherine Crooks owns that. So I know the whole neighborhood, and I know the people are very interested in this project. Um, I think four houses across the street is actually too many. I think three might work, but not four, um, in my opinion. Um, the condos in the back, it wasn't clear to me if they're going to be rentals or they're going to be for sale. The project on Lee Street, I looked at one time, I think they're rented, and the, the rent's 2000 a month. And that's quite, a, quite stiff for that area, if you ask me. Um, and, and I'm just going to go on kind of with my editorial, I think. Unfortunately, North Manny is not zoned historic, but it's a very historic neighborhood in town. And the Oakland's Mansion is a, is a tourist destination, and this is a venue. People travel up that road often, and it's anchored on South Manny um, by the Discovery Museum. And there were plans some years ago to revitalize the street of North Manny, like South Manny, and do repave it and put, put the, um, the service, the lights under the street. Are my three minutes up? I'll stop. Um, okay. But anyway, I, I'm not against this property proposal, but I think it should have been brought to the neighborhood to get their feedback so that we can, we can buy into this project and help support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Black. Please bear with me. I, uh, my name is Kathy Green and I live at 726 North Manny Avenue and I just accidentally found out about this meeting because I attend the church that's next to the proposed development. 
Um, but let me start off by saying when we moved here in 1995, we chose a house in the historic, what I thought was historic district. I'm just finding out evidently Manny wasn't designated historic. But we moved in downtown in spite of many people thinking we had lost our minds. Um, we loved the area because of the sidewalks and the, and the proximity to the Oaklands Park. And, um, but the fact that, we, that it was designated historic district, district was a particularly appealing because we thought that guaranteed the integrity and character of the neighborhood. Um, at the time, the area was known for drugs and high crime. And in fact, we moved next door to the crack house. And most people that were here at the time, the police knew it, visited often. And, um, but a few late years later, we were able to purchase that house and we had it immediately torn down. And waiting to see what would happen because a lot of people were moving in, the Bells moved next door to me and totally restored that beautiful brick antebellum house on Manny Avenue. Um, but after being given some assurances that the integrity of the neighborhood would be preserved, we went ahead and tore down our house and built a new house that looks like an old house on the middle of the two lots, which was maybe not smart financially, but we were more, we weren't trying to flip a house. We were trying to preserve the neighborhood and hopefully turn it around, which 20 years later we have and people are, are desiring to move in. And unfortunately that's, that's attracted to people that want to put a lot of things on a small property and to destroy the habitat around it. As a member of the church that abuts this property, we have three trees that line our driveway. I'm concerned what the impact will be to those trees if they, t and not only that, but it'd be really nice if they would develop and save as many of, because they have several mature trees on that lot, if they could try to put those in between and try to preserve our habitat because that's what makes Manny Avenue special. We have a lot of trees and I'd hate to lose that. And I'd also suggest because I have seen the project that Mr. Burns did on Lee and it's lovely from the front. If you're, if you're facing Lee, it looks lovely. It doesn't particularly belong in the neighborhood in my opinion, but it's lovely. But if you're driving up Manny Avenue, it's an eyesore because those townhouses are right on, look like, look like, I may be wrong, on the property line to this little house that's in front of it with no barrier, no, no green space between it. And so I, for that reason, I would hope they wouldn't build something a lot larger than what's on the front without some kind of buffer. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for coming out. My name is Steve Boffman. I live at 315 North Manny. I've lived there for over 40 years. I bought this house because it was old. Uh, moved here in the mid 70s and my family has grown up here. I'm an advocate of the historical society. I'm a board member. I've known Matthew for, well, when you first took the job here for a long time. We, uh, Tommy Bragg and I, when he was mayor, walked down Manny Avenue trying to get it an historic district. Too many lawyers owned property and voted all that down. That's why it didn't actually happen at that particular time, even though it is, is historic in nature. But I've lived there. I try and uh, advocate for preservation of it. My house was built in 1872. First house built in the subdivision of Manny when they started selling off property, trying to get restitution from the federal government. That never happened. So the Manny family started selling off three acre lots. And my house was one of the first ones built in the first subdivision of Murphy, official subdivision. When Tommy Bragg and I walked down Manny Avenue trying to get it under historic area, that was back in the 80s we tried to get sidewalks. There is still no sidewalks on this property that's trying to be developed. That was in 1980. I went and saw Matthew about it. You know, what, knowing this change was happening, 
what'd you tell me, 2024 is when, oh, we're gonna put sidewalks in. 40 years later, we still haven't gotten sidewalks on Manny Avenue. Anyway, I'm not against the proposal. I think it's good. I'd like to see you know, it tweaked. I think three units is better than four. It's all about how much money you're gonna make off of it. But, uh, you know, I've owned other property. I sold a lot of it. I restored homes there. Anyway, that's my, that's my two bits. But uh, use your judgment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Anybody else? My name is Vincent. Uh, I live at uh, 714 Elliott Drive, but I'm a very active member of the church on Manny Street. Um, to the point where I spend maybe four days a week there. <laughs> I'm there pretty, pretty often, very active. And to a lot of what my concerns were uh, said by uh, Kathy a little bit ago, but I guess the big concern that I've had really is just kind of started while I was sitting here listening to everything, and it's about the amount of exceptions that are being asked for on both properties, because it if you have set guidelines for areas and you need that many exceptions, I feel like you need to fall within the guidelines, because are they really guidelines at that point? How many other people are going to be asking for exceptions like that until eventually the, those guidelines just mean nothing? So I guess that's just kind of my two bits there. Thank you. All right, thank you for coming out. Carolyn. Who else? Nobody else, then we will close the public hearing and ask for comments and questions from the Planning Commission. Yeah. Uh, Start down there and go this way. Same, same for me as last time. I just would love to see the facade improve. Some, like I get the um, challenge in it. Not sure exactly how you make a three or four, you know, town ho town home building look like a single family home. But you know, we could try. Have some like different options we could look at maybe and see. I'll, I'll add on to that. The, the start with the leap portion of it. It looks a lot better than what it would be was replacing in, in the area. I think it feels a little dense to me too. Uh, at 12 units an acre for that little area, it feels that side of it feels dense. Uh, I appreciate the work on the houses on Manny to make them look craftsman, look make them look like the area, things like that. Just the townhome side seems dense to me. I agree with the density of the townhomes to the Lee Street side of things. I like the four single family. I don't mind the other exceptions in relation to the North Maney properties, but I do think we could lose a unit on Lee Street um, and that would allow for some more formal open space and also some additional parking. These are only one car garages, um, which I don't love. And then there's very, very tight guest parking that, in my opinion, uh, is going to be very um, difficult to pull in and out of for the guests. And, and I think that would be a big benefit of removing one of the units. So, Would you rather remove a front unit or a back unit? I think I would remove a rear unit, mm -hmm. um, personally, especially because the width of um, this lot is more narrow in the back than it is at the front, and also it just symmetry. No, I, I agree with you. I just wanted to ask because no one's going to park in their garage. I'm, I'm, you know how I feel about parking. No one is going to park in their garage. It's going to be used for storage. You can say that they have to park in their garage, but they won't. Um, so naturally, they are going to take up the spots in front of their unit, and then the guests will have very limited places to, to park, which means they could park on Lee Street or could end up blocking other people's driveways. So you know how I feel about parking. Sorry, Mr. Burns. 
Jamie, I, I agree with you. I think one unit off the back would actually help out a lot. I think it would create a lot more formal open space as well on the unit, on the, on the site. Uh, so that's something I would personally like to see as well. And I do appreciate the fact that you made the improvements that we talked about, and I know that you've already, I think it was originally eight as proposed, so I do acknowledge that losing a unit means losing revenue, um, but I just, I think 12 units per acre on that is real steep. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Burns with BA Homes. Uh, this is kind of what it comes down to on these sites. Downtown has been more of a hobby of mine than it is a business venture. I don't, and I, and I know it's not city council or, or planning departments to worry about what a person makes. But for me to go to these auctions, uh, I'm bidding against the slumlords you guys won't go on. The only way I get rid of the slumlords you guys won't go on, and I say you guys, I'm just talking about it in general, is I have to outbid them. And if you take the two, uh, the two commercial pieces in this property sold for $1.8 million. So you take the two commercial pieces out, and let's say you got 900,000 the rest of it. It's a big deal to lose one off the back when I've got the same exact project one block down beside it that parks fine and nobody parks in the streets on that entire project. I can't go, if, if that's what you make here, that's, if that's what you decide I have to do, that's what I have to do, but I can't go to these auctions and outbid the people that you don't, or I don't want there, maybe it's a better way of putting it, uh, if I don't have the way to get density. And, I, and I, I understood everybody that talked here. I love the downtown area. Uh, one of the houses, the Chamleys, that she was talking about, the blue house, the Chamleys, I'm the one that did that house, uh, Howard and I did. And, and we sold that house and it, it, was, it was Howard's college house. That was his hobby. We built it, we fixed it. It, it, it wasn't this. I also did the one on Spring Street. Huge loser. I try to save houses when I can save houses. There's none of these houses worth saving. Right now I got a squatter on one. I'm get, trying to get an attorney to get out. And the one on the front, Lily had somebody just walked out and I've never seen them uh, ever again. And there was a, try, a squatter trying to move in that one and I went over and kicked them out. That's what's over there now. This is a horrible area on Lee Street. And I, there's just not a nice, polite way to say it. But most of Lee Street needs to be torn down and replaced with stuff like this. The only way I can do that or other people can do that is it has to it can't be a loser like Spring Street was where I just go through and I just spend unlimited money and, and you lose money. It's my hobby, but I can't make it a loser either. Uh, it, has to, it has to be some sort of way profitable for people where nobody like me is going to go here and buy these uh, and do it. So, yeah, losing a unit in the back that I know is going to park well because it, I've got the exact same layout, a pitching wedge up from it up here on Lee Street. Just You can see them. Uh, I know it's going to park well, so yeah, it is. It's a big deal to lose that. Mr. Burns, what's the density of the Lee Street, your other Lee Street development? Uh, it's the backyards are a little deeper. I don't. Well, I say that now. You're 20 foot off the back. It can't be much more than this. I mean, probably 10. It's got. Yeah, uh, no, it's got seven. It's got three in the front and four in the back. I think doesn't it? It's as far as units per acre, Holly, what it? What is it? It's probably, it's less than, a, that's an acre and I got 10 or eight <clears throat> units on it, so. Mr. Bromley, can you look that up? Sure, it's working on it right now. Me. I'd like to know But it. the parking's the same. The parking, the driveways, the, all that's the same. So if there's any difference, it's the green space. I just don't know how I can keep going and, and buy, I, I just bought one at auction on Maple Street and it's, it's gonna be tore down and I'm gonna bring it to you guys to put two single family homes on it. I try to be sensitive to the streets I'm on. That's the reason I wanted to build these these Sear, I call these more the Sears and Roebuck Craftsman type homes that you used to buy in 1920 and they delivered it to your house and you built it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of what these homes are supposed to resemble. I couldn't, I can't build that kind of product on Lee Street, it just won't sell. Uh, if, just, if you think Lee Street needs to be redeveloped, I, I trust your judgment on that. I'm not super familiar with Lee Street, but I don't want to set an example of 12 units per acre if we're expecting a lot of development on Lee Street. I don't that's think not, people are just the beating the doors issue. down for Lee Street. My, what? I don't our, think people are just beating the doors down for Lee Street. The only people. Well, you got two developments on one street, Mr. Burns. <laughs> and, but, <laughs> yes, ma'am. At both times, I had to outbid the slumlords who wanted the houses to rent. Don't talk about my friends that way. I know, and, I, and some of my friends I was bidding against. Mr. Blomley, uh, did you look up the 
density? I, I did. I did a rough calculation. I think it's about 10.8 units per acre on the one to the north. You were still double digits, but just a little bit over double digits. I, Miss Abel, I know it'll park fine, uh, and, and and though I, I said I'm fine with the parking, but I still don't like the density. I don't love the density either. I'd rather build one beautiful, nice house there, but that just won't. I can't. That's not. Careful what you wish for. Okay. I know the economics don't work, but it doesn't. I have to sell it, and then the people buy it, and they do whatever they want to with it. I can't make it work then. I, I know what I know. Everybody wants beautiful, historic-looking homes, but that's not what's there now. What's there now is not safe. It's a. I can't get an appraiser hardly to stop by there for more than two minutes. Half of Clyde's pictures is him going 30 miles an hour down the road, snapping from the street. So. Uh, it's not, it's not I don't offend area. the people that live around this new development, Mr. Burns. Okay, well, you, you have my there. feelings on the density. I will, I will let go of the parking issue, but you have my feelings on the density. I understand, and I, and I wish I could accommodate. I just can't accommodate. I will, to accommodate what you want on density, I've got $100,000 a pad in each townhome. And people that's in real estate understands it's hard to, when you've got $100,000 a pad and then you're still doing the development, there's not much there. Well, developers in Rockvale are looking at $100,000 a pad, too. Yeah, it's, that's not Lee Street. Uh, I understand. I just, I'm just telling you the economics, how I have to look at it. And you have to make a split decision. It isn't like Comus Montgomery gives me a whole lot of time to, to, to <laughs> make the decision. So I've got the, the people you don't want buying the house here and me, and that's and maybe a couple others. Uh, I try to make every project I build something you guys don't have to dislike and I understand everybody wants I like beautiful store homes too uh, Mr. Burns what can you say about the facade on the front of Lee Street what can we do about that I chose to do that that's what our other project looks like I'm not a on, fan on of Lee the, Street yes I'm not a fan of making them look like one big long house there I think that looks but more what, what can you do to make this look better I think that looks really good everybody liked the other project on Lee Street I've never had one complaint on my Vine Street project which was right was in the pictures of what y'all did before this one and i've never had one complaint on the on the lee street project uh, we kind of got brought into the whole well, let's make it look like one big house and it doesn't work well with it doesn't work well with a, a triplex or a quad mm -hmm. i wasn't a fan of the, the other one i just don't think it looks good i think what you try to make them look like individual houses so people take pride in their home and you ain't got just one big complex there that you're putting people in. I'm just not a fan of that personally. What was the feedback on the facade, Brian? Did you, you said you didn't like the facade? Just that the, you know, I appreciate, I don't, I don't see how you make money either if you reduce your density. Exactly. But um, do the rules say make it look more like, fam you know, single family, but also I'm not sure how you do that either on a four. Uh, we've got it. Count on, but maybe either it like just get some ideas that would be the only project on Lee Street that would be under those rules. I, I don't know that that's a, even a good look for over there to have this one big massive structure with a big roof on it. It just, even then you need to break them up because later on in HOAs, when you've got these one big structures yeah. and this guy needs to replace his roof, I mean, how do you split the roofs up? You've got your shingles touching. You need to have, you need to have the, os the up and down of the roofs. Oh yeah, you need to have that for sure. But so you, you can it's hard to do that and have it one house. structure. Far be it from me to agree with Mr. Burns, but I don't love all the units looking like one either. I've said that at council. I've said that at planning commission. Um, so I think, but but not. I will. I mean, I think there's other ways to do it. Not one big solid, but you can have offsets and the one y'all the one y'all done right before this the, one. But um, Mr. Blumley, this. Uh, what we're discussing here regarding the making it look like one unit that is under the new CCO or what, where does that fall? Uh, it's in the, the North Highland study. The North Highland study. The North Highland study that we did 20? It was ago? it was adopted in 2016 I believe 2016 or 2017. Um, Adopted by the Planning Commission. Which amazing explanation, by the way. But the that, whole... that's what I'm just saying. That, that you know, M Mr. Burns, we can't argue your one thing needs to be excluded from the study that covers the whole area. Either, either it's in there, it's not. Maybe we need to change an ordinance or a, a 
our North Highland study that was adopted. Uh, but right now, that that is what it states, and just. I it's supposed to, I was always told it was a suggestion. It's not like, every, they, I've always been told when these studies come out and when the builders come out and then we, we don't, that and we're always told, this isn't the Bible, it's just a suggestion. Mr. Burns. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate it. We're gonna discuss it. <laughs> we'll call you back up if we have further questions for you, and, and I appreciate it. And Madam Chair, just for additional clarification, when we amended our zoning ordinance regarding the city core overlay district about a year or two ago, we put the language in the ordinance that, that plans in this area should attempt to the, to the degree feasible honor the North Island and historic bottoms studies. And that's included in the city core overlay district regulations. I've got one more question. That's not really about the development, but about the process. Right. <laughs> uh, it, was there a neighbor? Uh, we've had a couple of people call up and said there was no neighborhood meeting. Was there a neighborhood meeting to discuss this project with the neighbors prior to this process? No, sir. Hmm? No, sir. Right. I, I said no. Um. And this is, we're voting on one thing here. We're not voting on a Manny Street versus a Lee Street because it's all one proposal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got to all be something that we would. Um, I think I would trust if we, you know, everybody was cooperative, letting staff work on some different, you know, designs. If, I'd rather see this than not. Well, I want to, yeah. Anything, but we, we maybe want, they could work on just We want to see it. And we we love, changes. we love the fact that you're redeveloping and you've taken downtown as your personal project to, to take on, uh, but but we don't want to let something just get done and set set a precedence for anybody else that decides they want to come in and, and, and take it on as well. But we, we do appreciate it and we do want to work with it and figure it out and uh, I, I believe that we all want to want to see something uh, that we'd all be proud of I agree I, I think I would like to ha see a neighborhood meeting had with the neighbors so they can give input about the neighborhood uh, and then have staff more time to work on staff and mr. Burns have more time to work on knocking out whatever get everybody on the same Some page the, yeah. yeah I just feel like there's a lot of we're just not on the same page thank you so could that think we're, look like a deferral? Could we ask for that? How's our time look? So to get a neighborhood meeting organized um, and conducted, and then and then get back to you, probably looking at at um, at least a month. How, how does that put our application timeline? Uh, believe with the applicant's consent, we can defer. Uh, uh, for how, however long we need to, Mr. Hankins, would is that correct? Uh, yeah, essentially in, indefinite, of up to is it is it six months? I think it's 180 uh, days. Last that's time. with hit. That's with him deferring it, not us deferring it. Correct. Yeah, uh, bear with me just a moment, and I'll I'll pull up the ordinance. Hopefully, we're not talking about a lengthy deferral. Right. Just. A Something to be able to, to get the out. neighborhood meeting and let everybody get on somewhat the same page. Hmm? What did you have to request, Mr. Roundtree? Just want to, this was a situation where normally with a plan development, we do have a neighborhood meeting. Um, based on the direction we were given it wasn't required so that's why it wasn't like there was a way to avoid it um, just based on the context based on the situation based on the opportunity for Brian to get involved it was determined that it wasn't necessary so that's we just want to give you that background oh I, I, I wasn't saying you were trying to scare I just no. I was just looking for information based off the the people in the f audience mr. Wright um, according to the ordinance um, the Commission may defer action for not more than two months or for a greater period of time if the applicant so requests. So 
two months without the applicant's permission, a greater period of time with the applicant's permission. Motion to defer. And do we have to stay to time? Or two months within maximum two months or? I think. We have to say that in our motion. I, I, think, I think Mr. Burns or Mr. Roundtree may, may. Well, I, I, yeah, they're not, they don't, I don't think we have to ask them to say they want it for longer because they don't want it for two months. So, but, but they can defer for longer if they want to, but I'm I don't think they to want bring, to. I'm open for them to bring it back sooner, but yeah, let's just I'm say too. two months at the longest. I agree. Now. Thank you. Motion for defer for two months. Is yep. there a second? Second. All in favor, state aye. 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 Any opposed? And that would be a maximum of two months. Right. Ho hopefully we'll see it sooner. Okay. Thank you all very much. All right. We did have a mandatory referral under new business. I understand that may not be necessary anymore. That's correct. We took care of that long ago and didn't even remember. Okay. Any other business tonight before we adjourn? Just a reminder that you norm normally we have two weeks in between meetings, but we will be meeting next Wednesday, the 19th at 1 p.m. Next Thursday? No, next Wednesday at 1, 1 o'clock. See you then. It's a day meeting, right? It's, it's a day meeting. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, we stand adjourned.